Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer's Comrade, by Mark Twain. Chapter 30 When they got aboard, the king went for me, and shook me by the collar, and says, Trying to give us the slip, was he, you pup, tired of our company, hey? I says, No, your majesty, we weren't. Please don't, your majesty. Quick, then, and tell us what was your idea, or I'll shake the insides out o' oh, you. Honest, I'll tell you everything just as it happened, your majesty. The man that had a hold of me was very good to me, and kept saying he had a boy about as big as me that died last year, and he was sorry to see a boy in such a dangerous fix. And when they was all took by surprise by finding the gold, and made a rush for the coffin, he lets go of me and whispers, Heal it now, or they'll hang ye sure. And I lit out. It didn't seem no good for me to stay. I couldn't do nothing, and I didn't want to be hung if I could get away. So I never stopped running till I found the canoe. And when I got here I told Jim to hurry, or they'd catch me and hang me yet, and said I was a you and the Duke wasn't alive now, and I was awful sorry, and so was Jim, and was awful glad when we see you coming. You may ask Jim if I didn't. Jim said it was so, and the king told him to shut up and said, Oh, yes, it's mighty likely, and shook me up again, and said he reckoned he'd drowned me. But the duke says, There go the boy, you old idiot. Would you a done any different? Did you inquire around for him when you got loose? I don't remember it. So the king let go of me, and begun to cuss that town and everybody in it. But the duke says, You better a blame sight give yourself a good cussing, for you're the one that's entitled to it most. You hain't done a thing from the start that had any sense in it, except coming out so cool and cheeky with that imaginary blue arrow mark. That was bright. It was right down bully. And it was the thing that saved us. For if it hadn't been for that they'd a jailed us till them Englishmen's baggage come. And then, the penitentiary you bet. But that trick took him to the graveyard, and the gold done us a still bigger kindness. For if the excited fools hadn't let go all holds and made, that rush to get a look we'd a slept in our cravats to-night. Cravats warranted to wear, too. Longer than we'd need him. They was still a minute. Thinking. Then the king says, kind of absent-minded like. Nuv. And we reckoned the niggers stole it. That made me squirm. Yes, says the duke kinder slow and deliberate and sarcastic, we did. After about a half a minute the king rolls out. Leastways, I did. The duke says, the same way. On the contrary, I did. The king kind of ruffles up, and says, Looky here, Bilgewater, what are you referring to? The duke says, pretty brisk. When it comes to that, Maybe you'll let me ask, what was you referring to? Shucks, says the king, very sarcastic. But I don't know. Maybe you was asleep and didn't know what you was about. The duke bristles up now and says, Oh, let up on this cussed nonsense. Do you take me for a blame fool? Don't you reckon I know who hid that money in that coffin? Yes, sir. I know you do know, because you dumb it yourself. It's a lie. And the duke went for him. The king sings out. Take your hands off. Let go of my throat. I take it all back. The duke says. Well, you just own up first, that you did hide that money there, intending to give me the slip one of these days, and come back and dig it up, and have it all to yourself. Wait just a minute, do. Answer me this one question, honest and fair. If you didn't put the money there, say it, and I'll believe you, and take back everything I said. You old scoundrel, I didn't, and you know I didn't. There, now. Well, 
then i believe you but answer me only just this one more now don't get mad didn't you have it in your mind to cook the money and hide it the duke never said nothing for a little bit then he says well i don't care if i did i didn't do it anyway but you not only had it in mind to do it but you done it i wish i never die if i done it duke and that's honest i won't say i weren't going to do it because i was but you i mean somebody got in ahead of me it's a lie you done it and you got to say you done it or the king began to gurgle and then he gasps out nug i own up i was very glad to hear him say that it made me feel much more easier than what i was feeling before so the duke took his hands off and says if you ever deny it again i'll drown you it's well for you to set air and blubber like a baby it's fitten for you after the way you've acted i never see such an old ostrich for wanting to gobble everything and i trusting you all the time like you was my own father you ought to be ashamed of yourself to stand by and hear it saddled on to a lot of poor niggers and you never say a word for em it makes me feel ridiculous to think i was soft enough to believe that wabbage cuss you i can see now why you was so anxious to make up the deficit you wanted to get what money i got out of the nun such and one thing or another and scoop it all the king says to me and still a snuffling why duke it was you that said make up the deficit it warned me dry up i don't want to hear no more out of you says the duke and now you see what you've got by it they've got all their own money back and all of ourn but a shekel or two besides long to bed and don't you deficit me no more deficits longs you live so the king sneaked into the wigwam and took to his bottle for comfort and before long the duke tackled his bottle and so in about a half an hour they was as thick as thieves again and the tighter they got the lovinger they got and went off a snoring in each other's arms they both got powerful mellow but i noticed the king didn't get mellow enough to forget to remember to not deny about hiding the money back again that made me feel easy and satisfied of course when they got to snoring we had a long gabble and i told jim everything chapter thirty one we dasn't stop again at any town for days and days kept right along down the river we was down south in the warm weather now and a mighty long ways from home we begun to come to trees with spanish moss on them hanging down from the limbs like long gray beards it was the first i ever see it growing and it made the woods look solemn and dismal so now the frogs reckoned they was out of danger and they begun to work the villages again first they done a lecture on temperance but they didn't make enough for them both to get drunk on then in another village they started a dancing school but they didn't know no more how to dance than a kangaroo does so the first prance they made the general public jumped in and pranced them out of town another time they tried to go at yellocution but they didn't yellocute long till the audience put up and give them a solid good cussing and made them skip out they tackled missionarying and mesmerizing and doctoring and telling fortunes and a little of everything but they couldn't seem to have no luck so at last they got just about dead broke and laid around the raft as she floated along thinking and thinking and never saying nothing by the half a day at a time and dreadful blue and desperate and at last they took a change and begun to lay their heads together in the wigwam and talk low and confidential two or three hours at a time jim and me got uneasy we didn't like the look of it we judged they were studying up some kind of worse devotery than ever he turned it over and over and at last we made up our minds they was going to break into somebody's house or store 
or was going into the counterfeit money business, or something. So then we was pretty scared, and made up an agreement that we wouldn't have nothing in the world to do with such actions, and if we ever got the least show we would give them the cold shake, and clear out and leave them behind. Well, early one morning we hid the raft in a good, safe place about two mile below a little bit of a shabby village named Paxkill, and the king he went ashore and told us all to stay hid, whilst he went up to town and smelt around to see if anybody had got any one of the royal, none such there yet. House to rob, you mean, says I to myself. And when you get through robbing it, you'll come back here and wonder what has become of me and Jim and the raft, and you'll have to take it out in wondering. And he said if he weren't back by midday, the Duke and me would know it was all right, and we was to come along. So we stayed where we was. The Duke he fretted and sweated around, and was in a mighty sour way. He scolded us for everything, and we couldn't seem to do nothing right. He found fault with every little thing. Something was a brewing sure. I was good and glad when midday come and no king. We could have a change anyway, and maybe a chance for the change on top of it. So me and the Duke went up to the village and hunted around there for the king, and by and by we found him in the back room of a little low doggery, very tuddied, and a lot of loafers bullyragging him for sport, and he a-cussing and a-threatening with all his might, and so tight he couldn't walk, and couldn't do nothing to them. The duke he begun to abuse him for an old fool, and the king begun to sass back, and the minute they was fairly at it I let out and shook the reeks out of my hind legs, and spun down the river road like a deer, for I see our chance. And I made up my mind that it would be a long day before I ever see me and Jim again. I got down there all out of breath, but loaded up with joy, and sung out, Set her loose, Jim. We are all right now. But there weren't no answer, and nobody come out of the wigwam. Jim was gone. I set up a shout, and then another and then another one, and run this way and that in the woods, whooping and screeching. But it weren't no use. Old Jim was gone. Then I sat down and cried. I couldn't help it. But I couldn't set still long. Pretty soon I went out on the road, trying to think what I'd better do, and I run across a boy walking, and asked him if he'd seen a strange nigger dressed so and so, and he says, Yes. Whereabouts? says I. Down to Silas Phelps' place, two mile below here. He'd a runaway nigger, and they've got him. Was you looking for him? You bet I ain't. I run across him in the woods about an hour or two ago, and he said if I hollered he'd cut my livers out, and told me to lay down and stay where I was. And I done it been there ever since, afeard to come out. Well, he says you needn't be afeard no more, because they've got him. He run off from down south, Sumbers. It's a good job they got him. Well, I reckon there's two hundred dollars reward on him. It's like picking up money out in the road. Yes, it is, and I could have had it if I'd been big enough. I see him first. Who nailed him? It was an old fellow, a stranger, and he sold out his chance in him for forty dollars because he's got to go up the river and can't wait. Think o' that now. You bet I'd wait if it was seven year. That's me every time, says I. But maybe his chance ain't worth no more than that if he'll sell it so cheap. Maybe there's something ain't straight about it. But it is mo, straight as a string. I see the handbill myself. It tells all about him to a dot, paints him like a picture, and tells the plantation he's from below Nearlands. No, siree, Bob, they ain't no trouble about that speculation, you bet you. Say, give me a chalk tobacco, won't he? I didn't have none, so he left. I went to raft 
and set down in the wigwam to think. But I couldn't come to nothing. I thought till I were my head sore, but I couldn't see no way out of the trouble. After all this long journey, and after all we'd done for them scoundrels, here it was all come to nothing, everything all busted up and ruined, because they could have the heart to serve Jem such a trick as that, and make him a slave again all his life, and amongst strangers, too, for forty dirty dollars. Once I said to myself it would be a thousand times better for Jim to be a slave at home where his family was, as long as he'd got to be a slave, and so I'd better write a letter to Tom Sawyer and tell him to tell Miss Watson where he was. But I soon give up that notion for two things. She'd be mad and disgusted at his rascality and ungratefulness for leaving her, and so she'd sell him straight down the river again. And if she didn't, everybody naturally despises an ungrateful nigger, and they'd make Jim feel it all the time, and so he'd feel ornery and disgraced. And then think of me. It would get all around that Huck Finn helped a nigger to get his freedom. And if I was ever to see anybody from that town again, I'd be ready to get down and lick his boots for shame. That's just the way. A person does a low-down thing, and then he don't want to take no consequences of it. Thinks as long as he can hide it, it ain't no disgrace. That was my fix exactly. The more I studied about this, the more my conscience went to grinding me. And the more wicked and low down and ornery I got to feeling. And at last, when it hit me all of a sudden that here was the plain hand of Providence slapping me in the face and letting me know my wickedness was being watched all the time from up there in heaven, whilst I was stealing a poor old woman's nigger that hadn't ever done me no harm, and now was showing me there's one that's always on the lookout and ain't a-going to allow no such miserable doings to go only just so fur and no further. I most dropped in my tracks I was so scared. Well, I tried the best I could to kinder soften it up somehow for myself by saying I was brun up whipped, and so I weren't so much to blame. But something inside of me kept saying, there was the Sunday school, you could have on to it. And if you'd a done a bit to learn, you there that people that acts as I'd been acting about, that nigger goes to everlasting fire. It made me shiver. And I about made up my mind to pray, then see if I couldn't try to quit being the kind of a boy I was and be better. So I kneeled down. But the words wouldn't come. Why wouldn't they? It weren't no use to try and hide it from him. Nor from me, neither. I knowed very well why they wouldn't come. It was because my heart weren't right. It was because I weren't square. It was because I was playing double. I was letting on to give it up sin, but away inside of me I was holding on to the biggest one of all. I was trying to make my mouth say I would do the right thing and the clean thing, and go and write to that nader's owner and tell all where he was. But deep down in me I knowed it was a lie, and he knowed it. You can't pray a lie. I found that out. So I was full of trouble, full as I could be, and didn't know what to do. At last I had an idea, and I says, I'll go and write the letter, and then see if I can pray. Why, it was astonishing, the way I felt as light as a feather right straight off, and my troubles all gone. So I got a piece of paper and a pencil, all glad and excited, and sat down and wrote, Miss Watson, your runaway nigger Jim is down here to mile below Pecksville, and Mr. Phelps has got him, and he will give him up for the reward if you send. Huck Finn I felt good, and all wash clean of sin for the first time I had ever felt so in my life, and I knowed I could pray now. But I didn't do it straight off, but laid the paper down and set there thinking, thinking how good it was all this happened so, and how near I come to being lost and going to hell, and went on thinking, and got to thinking over our trip down the river, and I see Jim before me all the time, in the day and in the night time, sometimes moonlight, sometimes storms, and we'd a floating along, 
talking and singing and laughing. But somehow I couldn't seem to strike no places to harden me against him, but only the other kind. I'd see him standing my watch on top of his n, stead of calling me, so I could go on sleeping, and see him how glad he was when I come back out of the fog, and when I come to him again in the swamp up there where the feud was, and such like times, and would always call me honey, and peck me, and do everything he could think of for me, and how good he always was. And at last I struck the time I saved him by telling the men we had smallpox aboard, and he was so grateful, and said I was the best friend old Jim ever had in the world, and the only one he's got now. And then I happened to look around and see that paper. It was a close place. I took it up and held it in my hand. I was a trembling because I'd got to decide forever betwixt to things and I knowed it. I studied a minute, sort of holding my breath, and then says to myself, All right, then, I'll go to hell, and tore it up. It was awful thoughts and awful words, but they was said, and I let them stay said, and never thought no more about reforming. I shoved the whole thing out of my head, and said I would take up wickedness again, which was in my line, being brung up to it, and the other weren't. And for a starter, I would go to work, and steal Jem out of slavery again. And if I could think of anything worse, I would do that, too. Because as long as I was in, and in for good, I might as well go the whole hog. Then I set to thinking over how to get at it, and turned over some considerable many ways in my mind, and at last fixed up a plan that suited me. So then I took the bearings of a woody island that was down the river a piece, and as soon as it was fairly dark I crept out with my raft and went for it, and hid it there, and then turned in. I slept the night through, and got up before it was light, and had my breakfast, and put on my store clothes, and tied up some others, and one thing or another in a bundle, and took the canoe and cleared for shore. I landed below where I judged was Stelps's place, and hid my bundle in the woods, and then filled up the canoe with water, and loaded rocks into her, and sunk her where I could find her again when I wanted her. About a quarter of a mile below a little steam sawmill that was on the bank. Then I struck up the road, and when I passed the mill I see a sign on it, Phelps' sawmill, and when I come to the farmhouses, two or three hundred yards further along, I kept my eyes peeled, but didn't see nobody around, though it was good daylight now. But I didn't mind, because I didn't want to see nobody just yet. I only wanted to get the lay of the land. According to my plan, I was going to turn up there from the village, not from below. So I just took a look and shoved a law straight for town. Well, the very first man I see when I got there was the Duke. He was sticking up a bill for the Royal Nonsuch. Three night performance. Like that other time. They had the cheek, them frogs. I was right on him before I could shirk. He looked astonished and says, Fell low. Where do you come from? Then he says, kind of glad and eager, where is the raft? Got her in a good place. I says, My, that's just what I was going to ask your grace. Then he didn't look so joyful, and says, What was your idea for asking me? He says, Well, I says, when I see the king in that daubtry yesterday, I says to myself, We can't get him home for hours, till he's soberer, so I went a loafing around town to put in the time and wait. A man up and offered me ten cents to help him pull a skiff over the river and back to fetch a sheep, and so I went along. But when we was dragging him to the boat, and the man left me a hold of the rope and went behind him to shove him along, he was too strong for me and jerked loose and run, and we after him. We didn't have no dog and so we had to chase him all over the country till we tired him out. We never bought him till dark. Then we fetched him over, 
and I started down for the raft. When I got there and see it was gone, I says to myself, they've got into trouble and had to leave, and they've took my nigger, which is the only nigger I've got in the world, and now I'm in a strange country, and ain't got no property no more, nor nothing, and no way to make my living. So I sat down and cried. I slept in the woods all night. But what did become of the raft then? And Jim, poor Jim, blamed if I know. That is, what's become of the raft? That old fool had made a trade and got forty dollars, and when we found him in the doddery, the loafers had matched half dollars with him and got every cent but what he'd spent for whiskey. And when I got him home late last night and found the raft gone, we said, that little rascal has stole our raft and shook us and run off down the river. I wouldn't shake my nigger, would I? The only nigger I had in the world and the only property. We never thought of that. Fact is, I reckon we'd come to consider him our nigger. Yes, we did consider him so. Goodness knows we had trouble enough for him. So when we see the raft was gone and we flat broke, there weren't anything for it but to try the royal nun such another shake. And I've pegged along ever since, dry as a powder horn. Where's that ten cents? Give it here. I had considerable money, so I'd give him ten cents, but begged him to spend it for something to eat and give me some, because it was all the money I had, and I hadn't had nothing to eat since yesterday. He never said nothing. The next minute he whirls on me and says, Do you reckon that nigger would blow on us? We'd skin him if he'd done that. How can he blow? Ain't he run off? No, that old fool sold him, and never divided with me, and the money's gone. Sold him? I says, and begun to cry. Why, he was my nigger, and that was my money. Where is he? I want my nigger. Well, you can't get to your nigger, that's all. So dry up your blubbering. Look ye here. Do you think you'd venture to blow on us? Blamed if I think I'd trust you. Why, if you was to blow on us? He stopped, but I never see the duke look so ugly out of his eyes before. I went on a whimpering and says, I don't want to blow on nobody and I ain't got no time to blow, no. I got to turn out and find my nigger. He looked kinder bothered, and stood there with his bills fluttering on his arm, thinking and wrinkling up his forehead. At last, he says, I'll tell you something. We got to be here three days. If you'll promise you won't blow, and won't let the nigger blow, I'll tell you where to find him. So I promised, and he says, A farmer by the name of Silas, P.H. And then he stopped. You see, he started to tell me the truth. But when he stopped that way, and begun to study and think again, I reckoned he was changing his mind. And so he was. He wouldn't trust me. He wanted to make sure of having me out of the way the whole three days. So pretty soon, he says, the man that bought him is named Abram Foster, Abram G. Foster, and he lives forty mile back here in the country, on the road to Lafayette. All right, I says, I can walk it in three days, and I'll start this very afternoon. No, you won't. You'll start now, and don't you lose any time about it, neither, nor do any gabbling by the way. Just keep a tight tongue in your head and move right along, and then you won't get into trouble with us. Do I hear? That was the order I wanted, and that was the one I played for. I wanted to be left free to work my plans. So clear out, he says, and you can tell Mr. Foster whatever you want to. Maybe you can get him to believe that Jim is your nigger. Some idiots don't require documents. Leastways, I've heard there's such down south here. And when you tell him the handbill and the rewards bogus, 
Maybe he'll believe you when you explain to him what the idea was for getting him out. Along now, and tell him anything you want to. But mind you don't work your jaw any between here and there. So I left, and struck for the back country. I didn't look around, but I kinder felt like he was watching me. But I knowed I could tire him out at that. I went straight out in the country as much as a mile before I stopped. Then I doubled back through the woods towards Phelps. I reckoned I'd better start in on my clan straight off, without fooling around, because I wanted to stop Jim's mouth till these fellows could get away. I didn't want no trouble with their kind. I'd seen all I wanted to of them, and wanted to get entirely shut of them. Chapter 32 When I got there it was all still and Sunday-like, and hot and sunshiny. The hands was gone to the fields, and there was them kind of faint dronings of bugs and flies in the air that makes it seem so lonesome and like everybody's dead and gone. And if a breeze fans along and quivers the leaves, it makes you feel mournful, because you feel like it's spirits whispering. Spirits that's been dead ever so many years. And you always think they're talking about you. As a general thing, it makes a body wish he was dead, too, and done with it all. Phelps was one of these little one-horse cotton plantations, and they all look alike. A rail fence round a two-acre yard. A stile made out of lobs sought off and upended in steps, like barrels of a different length, to climb over the fence with, and for the women to stand on when they are going to jump onto a horse. Some sipply grass patches in the big yard, but mostly it was bare and smooth, like an old hat with a nap romped off. Big double lot house for the white folks. Few logs with the chinks stopped up with mud or mortar, and these mud stripes been whitewashed some time or another. Round log kitchen with a big broad, open but roofed passage joining it to the house. Log smoke house back of the kitchen. Pre little log nader cabins in a row to other side the smoke house. One little hut all by itself away down against the back fence and some at buildings down a piece the other side. Ash hopper and big kettle to bile soap in by the little hut, bench by the kitchen door, with bucket of water and a board. Hound asleep there in the sun, more hounds asleep round about. About three shade trees away off in a corner, some hurried bushes and gooseberry bushes in one place by the fence, outside of the fence of garden and a watermelon patch then the cotton fields begins and after the fields the woods i went around and clumb over the back stile by the ash hopper and started for the kitchen when i got a little ways i heard the dim hum of a spinning wheel wailing along up and sinking along down again and then i knowed for certain i wished i was dead for that is the lonesomest sound in the whole world. I went right along, not fixing up any particular plan, but just trusting to Providence to put the right words in my mouth when the time come. For I'd noticed that Providence always did put the right words in my mouth if I left it alone. When I got halfway, first one hound and then another got up and went for me, and of course I stopped and faced them and kept still. And such another powwow as they made. In a quarter of a minute I was a kind of a hub of a wheel. As you may say, spokes made out of dogs. Circle of fifteen of them, packed together around me, with their necks and noses stretched up towards me, a barking and howling. And more a coming. You could see them sailing over fences and around corners from everywheres. A never woman come tearing out of the kitchen with a rolling pin in her hand, singing out, Begun you tieish, you spot, begun sup. And she fetched first one, and then another of them, a clip, and sent them howling, and then the rest followed. And the next second half of them come back, wagging their tails around me, and making friends with me. There ain't no harm in a hound, now. 
and behind the woman comes a little knitter girl and two little knitter boys without anything on but tow linen shirts and they hung on to their mother's gown and peeped out from behind her at me bashful the way they always do and here comes white woman running from the house about forty-five or fifty year old air-headed and her spinning stick in her hand and behind her comes her little white children acting the same way the little mitteress was doing she was smiling all over so she could hardly stand and says it's you at last ain't it i out with the yes before i thought she grabbed me and hugged me tight and then gripped me by both hands and shook and shook and the tears come in her eyes and run down over and she couldn't seem to hug and shake enough and kept saying you don't look as much like your mother as i reckon you would but law sakes i don't care for that i'm so glad to see you dear dear it does seem like i could eat you up children it's your cousin tom tell him howdy but they ducked their heads and put their fingers in their mouths and hid behind her so she run on lies hurry up and get him a hot breakfast right away or did you get your breakfast on the boat i said i had got it on the boat so then she started for the house leading me by the hand and the children tagging after when we got there she set me down in a split-bottomed chair and set herself down on a little low stool in front of me holding both of my hands and says now i can have a good look at you and laws o me i've been hungry for it a many and a many a time all these long years and it's come at last we've been expecting you a couple of days and more what kept you most get aground yes'n she tilled up don't say yes'n say aunt sally where'd she get aground i didn't rightly know what to say because i didn't know whether the boat would be coming up the river or down but i go a good deal on instinct and my instinct said she would be coming up from down towards borland's that didn't help me much though for i didn't know the names of bars down that way i see i got to invent a bar or forget the name of the one we got a ground on or now i struck an idea and fetched it out it warned the grounding that didn't keep us back but a little we blowed out a cylinder head good gracious anybody hurt no killed a nigger well it's lucky because sometimes people do get hurt two years ago last christmas your uncle silas was coming up from mewlands on the old lally rock and she blowed out a cylinder head and crippled a man and i think he died afterwards he was a baptist your uncle silas knowed a family in baton rouge that knowed his people very well yes i remember now he did die mortification set in and they had to amputate him but it didn't save him yes it was mortification that was it he turned blue all over and died in the hope of a glorious resurrection they say he was a sight to look at your uncle's been up to the town every day to fetch you and he's gone again not more'n an hour ago he'll be back any minute now you must have met him on the road didn't you oldish man with a no i didn't see nobody aunt sally the boat landed just at daylight and i left my baggage on the wharf boat and went looking around the town and out a piece in the country to put in the time and not get here too soon and so i come down the back way who'd you give the baggage to nobody why child it'll be stole not where i did it i reckon it won't i says how do you get your breakfast so early on the boat it was kinder thin ice but i says the captain see me standing around and told me i better have something to eat before i went ashore so he took me in the texas to the officer's lunch and give me all i wanted i was getting so uneasy i couldn't listen bowed 
I had my mind on the children all the time. I wanted to get them out to one side and pump them a little and find out who I was. But I couldn't get no show Mrs. Feltz kept it up and run on so. Pretty soon she made the cold chill street all down my back because she says, But here we're a running on this way, and you hain't told me a word about sis, nor any of them. Now I'll rest my work so little, and you start up yourn. Just tell me everything. Tell me all about em, all every one of em, and how they are, and what they're doing, and what they told you to tell me, and every last thing you can think of. Well, I see I was up a stump, and up it could. Providence had stood by me this for all right, but I was hard and tight aground now. I see it warned a bit of use to try to go ahead. I'd got to throw up my hand. So I says to myself, here is another place where I got to rest the truth. I opened my mouth to begin. But she grabbed me and hustled me in behind the bed and says, here he comes. Stick your head down lower. There, that'll do. You can't be seen now. Don't you let on your hear. I'll play a joke on him. Children, don't you say a word. I see I was in a fix now. But it warn't no use to worry. There warn't nothing to do but just hold still and try and be ready to stand from under when the lightning struck. I had just one little glimpse of the old gentleman when he come in. Then the bed hit him. Mrs. Phelps, she jumps for him and says, has he come? No, says her husband. Goodness gracious. She says what in the world can have become of him. I can't imagine, says the old gentleman, and I must say it makes me dreadful uneasy. Uneasy, she says. I'm ready to go distracted. He must have come, and you've missed him along a road. I know it's so. Something tells me so. Why, Sally, I couldn't miss him along the road. You know that. But, oh, dear, dear, what will Sis say? He must have come. You must have missed him. Thee. Oh, don't distress me. Any more than I'm already distressed. I don't know what in the world to make of it. I'm at my wit's end, and I don't mind acknowledging them right down scared. But there's no hope that he's come for he couldn't come and me miss him. Sally, it's terrible. Just terrible. Something's happened to the boat. Sure. Why, Silas, look yonder. Up the road. Ain't that somebody coming? He sprung to the window at the head of the bed, and that gave Mrs. Phelps the chance she wanted. She stooped down quick at the foot of the bed and gave me a pull, and out I come. And when he turned back from the window, there she stood, a beaming and a smiling like a house of fire, and I standing pretty meek and sweaty alongside. The old gentleman stared and says, Why, who's that? Who do you reckon it is? I hain't no idea. Who is it? It's Tom Sawyer. My James, I most slumped through the floor. But there warn't no time to swap knives. The old man grabbed me by the hand and shook and kept on shaking. And all the time how the woman did dance around and laugh and cry. And then how they both did fire off questions about Sid and Mary and the rest of the tribe. But if it was joyful, it warn't nothing to what I was. For it was like being born again. I was so glad to find out who I was. Well... They froze to me for two hours. And at last, when my chin was so tired it couldn't hardly go any more, I had told them more about my family. I mean the Sawyer family. It never happened to any six Sawyer families. And I explained all about how we bloat out a cylinder head at the mouth of White River, and it took us three days to fix it, which was all right, and worked for straight because they didn't know but what it would take three days to fix it. If I'd a called it a bullhead, it would done just as well. 
now i was feeling pretty comfortable all down one side and pretty uncomfortable all up the other being tom sawyer was easy and comfortable and it stayed easy and comfortable till by and by i hear a steamboat coughing along down the river then i says to myself suppose tom sawyer comes down on that boat and suppose he steps in here any minute and sings out my name before i can throw him a wink to keep quiet well i couldn't have it that way it wouldn't do at all i must go up the road and waylay him so i told the folks i reckoned i would go up to the tan and fetch down my baggage the old gentleman was for going along with me but i said no i could drive the horse myself and i'd rather he wouldn't take no trouble about me chapter thirty three so i started for town in the wagon and when i was halfway i see a wagon coming and sure enough it was tom sawyer and i stopped and waited till he come along i says hold on and it stopped alongside and his mouth opened up like a trunk and stayed so and he swallowed two or three times like a person that's about a dry throat and then says i hain't ever done you no harm you know that so then what you want to come back and hang me for i says i hain't come back i hain't been gone when he heard my voice it righted him up some but he weren't quite satisfied yet he says don't you play nothing on me because i wouldn't on you honest injun now you ain't a ghost honest injun i ain't i says well by i well that ought to settle it of course but i can't somehow seem to understand it no way looky here warn't you ever murdered at all no i warn't ever murdered at all i played it on them you come in here and feel of me if you don't believe me so he done it and it satisfied him and he was that glad to see me again he didn't know what to do and he wanted to know all about it right off because it was a grand adventure and mysterious and so it hit him where he lived but i said leave it alone till by and by and told his driver to wait and we drove off a little piece and i told him the kind of a fix i was in and what did he reckon we'd better do he said let him alone a minute and don't disturb him so he thought and thought and pretty soon he says it's all right i've got it take my trunk in your wagon and let on its yourn and you turn back and fool along slow so as to get to the house about the time you ought to and i'll go towards town of keys and take a fresh start and get there a quarter or a half an hour after you and you needn't let on to know me at first i says all right but wait a minute there is one more thing a thing that nobody don't know but me and that is there's a nigger here that i'm a-trying to steal out of slavery and his name is jim old miss watson's jim he says what why jim is he stopped and went to study i says i know what you will say you'll all say it's dirty low-down business but what if it is i'm low down and i'm a-going to steal him and i want to keep mom and not let on will do his eye lit up and he says i'll help you steal him well i let go all holts then like i was shot it was the most astonishing speech i ever heard and i'm bound to say tom sawyer fell considerable in my estimation only i couldn't believe it tom sawyer a nigger stealer oh shucks i says you're joking i ain't joking either well then i says joking or no joking if you hear anything said about a runaway nigger don't forget to remember that you don't know nothing about him and i don't know nothing about him then we took the trunk and put it in my wagon and he drove off his way and i drove mine 
but of course i forgot all about driving slow on accounts of being glad and full of thinking so i got home a heap too quick for that length of a trip the old gentleman was at the door and he says why this is wonderful whoever would have thought it was in that mare to do it i wish we'd a timed her and she hain't sweated a hair not a hair it's wonderful why i wouldn't take a hundred dollars for that horse now i wouldn't honest and yet i'd a sold her for fifteen before and thought was all she was worth that's all he said he was the innocentest best old soul i ever see but it warn't surprising because he warn't only just a farmer he was a preacher too and had a little one-horse law church down back of the plantation which he built it himself at his own expense for a church and schoolhouse and never charged nothing for his preaching and it was worth it too there was plenty other farmer preachers like that and done the same way down south in about half an hour tom's wagon drove up to the front stile and aunt sally she see it through the window because it was only about fifty yards and says why there's somebody come i wonder who tis why i do believe it's a stranger jimmy that's one of the children run and tell lies to put on another plate for dinner everybody made a rush for the front door because of course a stranger don't come every year and so he lays over the yaller fever for interest when he does come tom was over the stile and starting for the house the wagon was spinning up the road for the village and we was all bunch in the front door tom had his store clothes on and an audience and that was always nuts for tom sawyer in them circumstances it warmed no trouble to him to throw in an amount of style that was suitable he warned a boy to meeky a lawn up that yard like a sheep no he can't come and important like the ram when he got a front of us he lifts his hat ever so gracious and dainty like it was a lid of a box that had butterflies asleep in it and he didn't want to disturb them and says mr archibald mickles i presume no my boy says the old gentleman i'm sorry to say your driver has deceived you nicholas's place is down a matter of three mile more come in come in tom he took a look back over his shoulder and says too late he's out of sight yes he's gone my son and you must come in and eat your dinner with us and then we'll hitch up and take you down to nicholas's oh i can't make you so much trouble i couldn't think of it i'll walk i don't mind the distance but we won't let you walk it wouldn't be southern hospitality to do it come right in oh do says aunt sally it ain't a bit of trouble to us not a bit in the world you must say it's a long dusty three mile and we can't let you walk and besides i've already told him to put on another plate when i see you coming so you mustn't disappoint us come right in and make yourself at home so tom he thanked them very hearty and handsome and let himself be persuaded and come in and when he was in he said he was a stranger from hicksville ohio and his name was william thompson and he made another bow well he run on and on and on making up stuff about hicksville and everybody in it he could invent and i getting a little nervous and wondering how this was going to help me out of my scrape and at last still talking along he reached over and kissed aunt sally right on the mouth and then settled back again in his chair comfortable and was going on talking but she jumped up and wiped it off with the back of her hand and says you audacious puppy he looked kind of hurt and says i'm surprised at you ma'am you're sirk why but do you reckon i am i've a good notion to take aunt say what do you mean by kissing me he looked kind of humble and says 
I didn't mean nothing, ma'am. I didn't mean no harm. I, I, thought you'd like it. By you born fool. She took up the spinning stick, and it looked like it was all she could do to keep from giving him a crack with it. What made you think I'd like it? Well, I don't know. Only May. They told me you would. They told you I would. Whoever told you's another lunatic. I never heard the beat of it. Who say? Why, everybody. They all said so, ma'am. It was all she could do to hold in. And her eyes snapped, and her fingers worked like she wanted to scratch him. And she says, Who's everybody? Out with their names, or there will be an idiot short. He got up and looked distressed, and fumbled his hat, and says, I'm sorry, and I weren't expecting it. They told me to. They all told me to. They all said, kiss her, and said she'd like it. They all said it, every one of them. But I'm sorry, ma'am, and I won't do it no more. I won't, honest. You won't, won't you? Well, I should reckon you won't. No, m I'm honest about it. I won't ever do it again. Till you ask me. Till I ask you? Well, I never see the beat of it in my born days. I laid you me the Methuselah skull of creation before ever I ask you, or the likes of you. Well, he says it does surprise me so. I can't make it out, somehow. They said you would, and I thought you would. But he stopped and looked around slow, like he wished he could run across a friendly eye somewheres, and fetched up on the old gentleman, and says, Didn't you think she'd like me to kiss her, sir? Why, no. I, I, well, no, I believe I didn't. Then he looks on around the same way to me, and says, Tom, didn't you think Aunt Sally'd open out her arms and say, Sid Sawyer, my land, she says, breaking in and jumping for him, you'd impudent young rascal to fool a body so, and was going to hug him, but he fended her off and says, no, not till you've asked me first. So she didn't lose no time, but asked him, and hugged him and kissed him over and over again, and then turned him over to the old man, and he took what was left. And after they got a little quiet again, she says, Why, dear me, I never see such a surprise. We weren't looking for you at all, but only Tom. Sis never wrote to me about anybody coming but him. It's because it weren't intended for any of us to come but Tom, he says. But I begged and begged, and at the last minute she let me come too. So, coming down the river... Me and Tom thought it would be a first-rate surprise for him to come here to the house first, and for me to buy and buy tab along and drop in and let on to be a stranger. But it was a mistake, and Sally, this ain't no healthy place for a stranger to come. No, not impudent whelps, Sid. You got to head your jaws boxed. I hain't been so put out since I don't know when. But I don't care, I don't mind the terms. I'd be willing to stand a thousand such jokes to have you here. Well, to think of that performance. I don't deny it. I was most purified with astonishment when you give me that smack. We had dinner out in that broad open passage betwixt the house and the kitchen. And there was things enough on that table for seven families. And all hot, too. None of your flabby tufted meat that's laid in a cupboard in a damp cellar all night and tastes like a hunk of old cold cannibal in the morning. Uncle Silas, he asked a pretty long blessing over it, but it was worth it, and it didn't cool it a bit, either, the way I've seen them kind of interruptions do lots of times. There was a considerable bit deal of talk all the afternoon, and me and Tom was on the lookout all the time, but it warn't no use, they didn't happen to say nothing about any runaway nigger, 
and we was afraid to try to work up to it. But at supper, at night, one of the little boys says, Pa, main Tom, and Sid and me go to the show? No, says the old man, I reckon there ain't going to be any, and you couldn't go if there was, because the runaway nigger told Burton and me all about that scandalous show, and Burton said he would tell the people. So I reckon they've drove the audacious loafers out of town before this time. So there it was, but I couldn't help it. Tom and me was to sleep in the same room and bed. So, being tired, we bid good night and went up to bed right after supper and clumb out of the window and down the lightning rod and shove for the town. For I didn't believe anybody was going to give the king and the duke a hint. And so if I didn't hurry up and give them one, they'd get into trouble, sure. On the road, Tom, he told me all about how it was reckoned I was murdered and how Pap disappeared pretty soon and didn't come back no more. And what a stir there was when Jim won a ray. And I told Tom all about our royal mount such rapscallions and as much of the raft void as I had time to. And as we struck into the town and up through the, the middle of it, it was as much as half after eight, then. Here comes a raging rush of people with torches, and an awful whooping and yelling and banging tin pans and blowing horns. And we jumped to one side to let them go by. And as they went by, I seen they had the king and the duke a straddle of a rail. That is, I knowed it was the king and the duke, though they was all over char and feathers, and didn't look like nothing in the world that was human just looked like a couple of monstrous big soldier plumes. Well, it made me sick to see it, and I was sorry for them poor pitiful rascals. It seemed like I couldn't ever feel any hardness against them any more in the world. It was a dreadful thing to see. Keek human beings can be awful cruel to one another. We see we was too late. Couldn't do no good. We asked some straddlers about it. And they said everybody went to the show looking very innocent, and laid low and kept dark till the poor old king was in the middle of his cavortings on the stage. Then somebody give a signal, and the house rose up and went for them. So we poked along back home, and I warmed feeling so brash as I was before, but kind of warnery and humble, and to blame, somehow, though I hadn't done nothing. But that's always the way. It don't make no difference whether you do right or wrong. A person's conscience ain't got no sense and just woes for him anyway. If I had a yaller dog that didn't know no more than a person's conscience does, I would pison him. It takes up more room than all the rest of a person's insides and yet ain't no good no how. Tom Sawyer, he says the same. Chapter 34 We stopped talking and got to thinking. I and by Tom says, Looky here, Huck, what fools we are to not think of it before. I bet I know where Jim is. No, where? In that hut down by the ash hopper. Why, Loki here? When we was at dinner, didn't you see a nigger man bow in there with some victuals? Yes. What did you think the victuals was for? For a dog. So die. Well, it wasn't for a dog. Why? Because part of it was watermelon. So it was. I noticed it. Well, it does beat all that I never thought about a dog not eating watermelon. It shows how body can see and don't see at the same time. Well, the knitter unlocked the padlock when he went in, and he locked it again when he came out. He fetched Uncle Lucky about the time we got up from table. Same key, I bet. Watermelon shows man, lock shows prisoner. And it ain't likely there's two prisoners on such a little plantation, and where the people's all so kind and good. Jim's the prisoner. All right. I'm glad we found it out detective fashion. I wouldn't give shucks for any other way. Now you work your mind, and study out a plan to steal Jim, and I will study out one two, and we'll take the one we like the best. What a head for just a boy to have. 
if i had tom sawyer's head i wouldn't trade it off to be a duke nor mid of a steamboat nor clown in a circus nor nothing i can think of i went to thinking out a plan but only just to be doing something i knowed very well where the right plan was going to come from pretty soon tom says ready yes i says all right bring it out my plan is this i says we can easy find out if it's jim in there then get up my canoe to-morrow night and fetch my raft over from the island then the first dark night that comes steal a key out of the old man's breeches after he goes to bed and shove off down the river on the raft with jim hiding daytimes and running nights the way me and jim used to do before wouldn't that plan work worked why certainly it would work like rats a-fighting but it's to blame simple there ain't nothing to it what's the good of a plan that ain't no more trouble than that it's as mild as goose milk why huck it wouldn't make no more talk than breaking into a soap factory i never said nothing because i warn't expecting nothing different but i knowed mighty well that whenever he got his plan ready it wouldn't have none of them objections to it and it didn't he told me what it was and i see in a minute it was worth fifteen of mine for style and would make jim just as free a man as mine would and maybe get us all pilled besides so i was satisfied and said we would waltz in on it i needn't tell what it was here because i knowed it wouldn't stay the way it was i knowed he would be changing it around every which way as we went along and heaving in new bullinesses wherever he got a chance and that is what he done well one thing was dead sure and that was that tom sawyer was in earnest and was actually going to help steal that nigger out of slavery that was the thing that was too many for me here was a boy that was respectable and well brung up and had a character to lose and folks at home that had characters and he was bright and not leather-headed and knowing and not ignorant and not mean but kind and yet here he was without any more pride or rightness or feeling than to stoop to this business and make himself a shame and his family a shame before everybody i couldn't understand it no way at all it was outrageous and i knowed i ought to just up and tell him so and so be his true friend and let him quit the thing right where he was and say it himself and i did start to tell him but he shut me up and says don't you reckon i know what i'm about don't i generally know what i'm about yes didn't i say i was going to help steal the nigger yes well ben that's all he said and that's all i said it warn't no use to say any more because when he said he'd do a thing he always done it but i couldn't make out how he was willing to go into this thing so i just let it go and never bothered no more about it if he was bound to have it so i couldn't help it when we got home the house was all dark and still so we went on down to the hut by the ash hopper for to examine it we went through the yard so as to see what the hounds would do they knowed us and didn't make no more noise than country dogs is always doing when anything comes by in the night when we got to the cabin we took a look at the front and the two sides and on the side i warn't acquainted with which was the north side he found a square window hole up tolerable high with just one stout board nailed across it i says here's the ticket this hole's big enough for jim to get through if we wrench off the board tom says it's as simple as tic-tac-toe three in a row and as easy as playing hooky i should hope we can find a way that's a little more complicated than that hawk finn well then i says how'll it do to sort him out the way i done before i was murdered that time that's more like he says it's real mysterious and troublesome and good 
he says. But I bet we can't find a way that's twice as long. There ain't no hurry. Let's keep on looking around. Betwixt the hut and the fence on the back side was a lean to that joined the hut at the eaves and was made out of plank. It was as long as the hut, but narrow, only about six foot wide. The door to it was at the south end and was padlocked. Tom, he went to the soap kettle and searched around and fetched back the iron thing they lift the lid with. So he took it and prized out one of the staples. The chain fell down, and we opened the door and went in and shut it and struck a match and see the shed was only built against a cabin and had no connection with it. And there weren't no floor to the shed, nor nothing in it but some old rusty played out hoes and spades and picks and a crippled plough. The match went out, and so did we, and shoved in the staple again, and the door was locked as good as ever. Tom was joyful. He says, Now we are all right. We'll dig him out. It'll take about a week. Then we started for the house, and I went in the back door. You only have two pole buckskin latch string. A don't fasten the brewers. But that weren't romantical enough for Tom Sawyer. No way would do him, but he must climb up the lightning rod. But after he got up halfway about three times, and missed fire and fell every time, and the last time most busted his brains out, he thought he got to give it up. But after he was rested, he allowed he would give her one more turn for luck, and this time he made the trip. In the morning, we was up at break of day, and down to the knitter cabins to pet the dogs and make friends with the nigger that fed Jim, if it was Jim that was being fed. The niggers was just getting through breakfast and starting for the fields, and Jim's nigger was piling up a tin pan with bread and meat and things, and whilst the others was leaving, the key come from the house. This knitter had a good-natured, chuckle-headed face, and his wool was all tied up in little bunches with thread. That was to keep witches off. He said the witches was pestering him awful these nights, and making him see all kinds of strange things, and hear all kinds of strange words and noises, and he didn't believe he was ever witch so long before in his life. He got so worked up, and got to running on so about his troubles, he forgot all about what he'd been a-going to do. So Tom says, What's the vittles for? Going to feed the dogs. The knitter kind of smiled around gradually over his face, like when you heave a brick bed in a muck puddle, and he says, Yes, Mars said a dog. Kuro's dog, too. Does you want to go and look at him? Yes. I hunch Tom and whispers. Who going right here in the daybreak? That weren't the plan. No, it weren't. But it's the plan now. So drat him we went along, but I didn't like it much. When we got in we couldn't hardly see anything. It was so dark. But Jim was there, sure enough, and could see us. And he sings out. Why, Huck? And good lad, Ain't that Mr. Tom? I just knowed how it would be. I just expected it. I didn't know nothing to do. And if I had, I couldn't a done it. Because that knitter busted in and says, Why, de gracious sakes, did he know you gentlemen? We could see pretty well now. Tom, he looked at the nigger, steady and kind of wondering, and says, Does who know us? Why, dis your runaway nigger? I don't reckon he does. But what put that into your head? What put it dar? Didn't he jeez dis minute sing out like he knowed you? Tom says in a puzzled up kind of way. Well, that's mighty curious. Who sung out? When did he sing out? What did he sing out? And turns to me perfectly calm and says, Did you hear anybody sing out? Of course, there weren't nothing to be said but the one thing. So I says, No. 
I ain't heard nobody say nothing. Then he turns to Jim, and looks him over like he never see him before, and says, Did you say out? No, sir, says Jim. I hain't said nothing, sir. Not a word. No, sir, I hain't said a word. Did you ever see us before? No, sir. Not, as I knows on. So Tom turns to the nigger, which was looking wild and distressed, and says, kind of severe, What do you reckon's a matter with you, anyway? What made you think somebody sun out? Oh, it's de dad blame witches. Sa, so, and I wish I was dead, I do. Days allus at it. Sa, so, and day do moss kill me. Day skeers me so. Please to don't tell nobody about it, sa, so, or old Morris Silas he'll school me. Case he say day ain't no witches. I jeez wish to goodness he was he now. Dan what would he say? I jeez bait he couldn't find no way to get around it dis time. But it's always jeez so. People back salt stays salt. They won't look into nothing and find it out for deselves, and when you find it out and tell em about it, they don't believe you. Tom give him a dime and said we wouldn't tell nobody, and told him to buy some more thread to tie up his wool with, and then looks at Jim and says, I wonder if Uncle Silas is going to hang this nigger. If I was to catch a nigger that was ungrateful enough to run away, I wouldn't give him up, I'd hang him. And whilst the nigger stepped to the door to look at the dime and bite it to see if it was good, he whispers to Jim and says, Don't ever let on to know us. And if you hear any digging going on nights, it's us. We are going to set you free. Jim only had time to grab us by the hand and squeeze it. And the nigger come back, and we said we'd come again sometime if the nigger wanted us to. And he said he would more particular if it was dark, because the witches went for him mostly in the dark, and it was good to have folks around then. Chapter 35 It would be most an hour yet till breakfast, so we left and struck down into the woods, because Tom said, we got to have some light to see how to dig by, and a lantern makes too much, and might get us into trouble. What we must have was a lot of them rotten chunks that's called fox fire, and just makes a soft kind of a glow when you lay them in a dark place. We fetch an armful, and hid it in the weeds, and sit down to rest, and Tom says, kind of dissatisfied. Blame it, this whole thing is just as easy and awkward as it can be and so it makes it so rotten difficult to get up a difficult plan. There ain't no watchman to be drugged. Now there ought to be a watchman. There ain't even a dog to give a sleeping mixture to. And there's Jim chained by one leg, with a ten-foot chain, to the leg of his bed. Why, all you got to do is to lift up the bedstead and slip off the chain. And Uncle Silas, he trusts everybody sends the key to the pumpkin-headed nigger, and don't send nobody to watch the nigger. Jim could have got out of that window hole before this, only there wouldn't be no use trying to travel with a ten-foot chain on his leg. Why, dread it, Huck, it's the stupidest arrangement I ever see. You got to invent all the difficulties. Well, we can't help it. We got to do the best we can with the materials we've got. Anyhow, there is one thing. There is more honor in getting him out through a lot of difficulties and dangers, where there weren't one of them furnished to you by the people who it was their duty to furnish them, and you had to contrive them all out of your own head. Now look at just that one thing of the lantern. When you come down to the cold facts, we simply got to let on that a lantern's risk I why, we could work with the torchlight procession if we wanted to, I believe. Now, whilst I think of it, we got to hunt up something to make a saw out of the first chance we get. What do we want of a saw? What do we want of it? Ain't we got to saw the leg of Jim's bed off so as to get the chain loose? Why, you just said a body could lift up the bedstead and slip the chain off. Well, 
if that ain't just like you huck finn you can get up the infant school east ways of going at a finn why hain't you ever read any books at all marin trent nor casanova nor benvenuto cellini nor henry ev nor none of them harrows who ever heard of getting a prisoner loose in such an old maidy way as that no the way all the best authorities does is to saw the bed leg in two and leave it just so and swallow the sawdust so it can't be found and put some dirt and grease around the sawed place so the very keenest senescal can't see no sign of its being sawed and thinks the bed leg is perfectly sound then the night you're ready fetched the leg it kick down she goes slip off your chain and there you are nothing to do but hitch your rope ladder to the battlements chin down it break your leg in the mode because a rope ladder is nineteen foot too short you know and there's your horses and your trusty vassals and they scoop you up and fling you across a saddle and away you go to your native languedoc or navarre or wherever it is it's gaudy huck i wish there was a moat to this cabin if we get time the night of the escape we'll dib one i says what do we want of a moat when we're going to snake him out from under the cabin but he never heard me he had forgot me and everything else he had his chain in his hand binking pretty soon he sighs and shakes his head then sighs again and says no it wouldn't do there ain't necessity enough for it for what i says why to saw jim's leg off he says could land i says why there ain't no necessity for it and what would you want to saw his leg off for anyway well some of the best authorities has done it they couldn't get the chain off so they just cut their hand off and shoved and a leg would be better still but we got to let that go there ain't necessity enough in this case and besides jim's a nigger and wouldn't understand the reasons for it and how it's a custom in europe so we let it go but there's one thing he can have a rope ladder we can tear up our sheets and make him a rope ladder easy enough and we can send it to him in a pie it's mostly done that way and i've it worse pious why tom sawyer how you talk i says jim ain't got no use for a rope ladder he has got use for it how you talk you better say you don't know nothing about it he's got to have a rope ladder they all do what in the nation can he do with it do with it he can hide it in his bed can't he that's what they all do and he's got to too huck you don't care seem to want to do anything that's regular you want to be starting something fresh all the time s'pose he don't do nothing with it ain't it there in his bed for a clue after he's gone and don't you reckon they'll want clues of course they will and you wouldn't leave in any that would be a pretty howdy do wouldn't it i never heard of such a thing well i says if it's in the regulations and he's got to have it all right let him have it because i don't wish to go back on no regulations but there's one thing tom sawyer if we go to tearing up our sheets to make jim a rope ladder we are going to get into trouble with aunt sally just as sure as you're born now the way i look at it a hickory bark ladder don't cost nothing and don't waste nothing and is just as good to load up a pie with and high in a straw tick as any rad ladder you can start and as for jim he ain't had no experience and so he don't care what kind of a oh shucks huck finn if i was as ignorant as you i'd keep still that's what i'd do who ever heard of a state prisoner escaping by a hickory bark ladder why it's perfectly ridiculous well all right tom fix it your own way but if you'll take my advice 
you'll let me borrow a sheet off of the clothes line he said that would do and that gave him another idea and he says borrow a shirt too what do we want of a shirt tom want it for jim to keep a journal on journal your granny jim can't write suppose he can't write he can make marks on the shirt can't he if we make him a pen out of an old pewter spoon or a piece of an old iron barrel hoop why tom we can pull a feather out of a goose and make him a better one and quicker too prisoners don't have geese running around the dungeon keep to pull pens out of you mugtons they always make their pens out of the hardest toughest troublesomest piece of old brass candlestick or something like that they can get their hands on and it takes them weeks and weeks and months and months to file it out too because they've got to do it by rubbing it on the wall they wouldn't use a goose quill if they had it it ain't regular well then what'll we make him the ink out of many makes it out of iron rust and tears ut that's the common sort and women the best authorities uses their own blood jim can do that and when he wants to send any little common ordinary mysterious message to let the world know where he's captivated he can write it on the bottom of a tin plate with a fork and throw it out of the window the iron mask always done that and it's a blame good weight too jim ain't got no tin plates they fee him in a pan that ain't nothing we can get him some can't nobody read his plates that ain't got anything to do with it uck finn all he's got to do is to write on the plate and throw it out you don't have to be able to rig it why half the time you can rid anything a prisoner writes on a tin plate or anywhere else well then what's the sense in wasting the plates why blame it all it ain't the prisoner's plates but it's somebody's plates ain't it well s'posen it is what does the prisoner care whose he broke off there because we heard the breakfast horn blowing so we cleared out for the house along during the morning i borrowed a sheet and a white shirt off of the clothes line and i found an old sack and put them in it and we went down and got the fox fire and put that in too i called it borrowing because that was what pap always called it but tom said it weren't borrowing it was stealing he said we was representing prisoners and prisoners don't care how they get a thing so they get it and nobody don't blame them for it either it ain't no crime in a prisoner to steal the thing he needs to get away with tom said it's his right and so as long as we was representing a prisoner we had a perfect right to steal anything on this place we had the least use for to get ourselves out of prison with he said if we weren't prisoners it would be a very different thing and nobody but a mean ornery person would steal when he warned a prisoner so we allowed we would steal everything there was that come handy and yet he made a mighty fuss one day after that when i stole a watermelon out of the nigger patch and eat it and he made me go and give the knitters a dime without telling them what it was for tom said that what he meant was we could steal anything we needed well i says i needed the watermelon but he said i didn't need it to get out of prison with there is where the difference was he said if i'd wanted it to hide a knife in and smuggle it to jim to kill the santa skull with it would have been all right so i let it go at that though i couldn't see no advantage in my representing a prisoner if i got to set down and chaw over a lot of gold leaf distinctions like that every time i see a chance to hug a watermelon well as i was saying we waited that morning till everybody was settled down to business and nobody in sight around the yard then tom he carried the sack into the lean-to whilst i stood off a piece to keep watch by and by he come out and we went and sat down on the wood pile to talk he says everything's all right now except tools 
and that easy fixed. Tools, I says. Yes. Tools for what? Why, to dig web. We ain't a going to know him out, are we? Ain't them old crippled picks and things, and they're good enough to dig a knitter out with? I says. He turns on me, looking pitying enough to make a body cry, and says, Huck Fain, did you ever hear of a prisoner having picks and shovels and all the modern conveniences in his wardrobe to dig himself out with? Now I want to ask you, if you got any reasonableness in you at all, what kind of a show would that give him to be a hero? Why, they might as well lend him the key and done with it. Picks and shovels. Why, they wouldn't furnish him to a king. Well, then, I says, if we don't want the picks and shovels, what do we want? A couple of case knives. To dig the foundations out from under that cabin with? Yes. Confound it, it's foolish, Tom. It don't make no difference how foolish it is. It's the right way, and it's the regular way. And there ain't no other way that ever I heard of and I've read all the books that gives any information about these things. They always dig out with a case knife, and not through dirt, mind you. Generally it's through solid rock, and it takes them weeks and weeks and weeks, and forever and ever. Why, look at one of them prisoners in the bottom dungeon of the castle Deef, in the harbor of Marsilis, that dug himself out that way. How long was he at it, you reckon? I don't know. Well, guess. I don't know. A month and a half. Thirty-seven year. And he come out in China. That's the kind. I wish the bottom of this fortress was solid rock. Jim don't know nobody in China. What's that got to do with it? Neither did that other fellow. But you're always a wandering off on a side issue. Why can't you stick to the main point? All right. I don't care where he comes out. So he comes out. And Jim don't either, I reckon. But there's one thing anyway. Jim's too old to be dug out with a case knife. He won't last. Yes, he will last, too. You don't reckon it's going to take thirty-seven years to dig out through a dirt foundation, do you? How long will it take, Tom? Well, we can't rest being as long as we ought to, because it may take very long for Uncle Silas to hear from down there by New Orleans. He'll hear Jim ain't from there. Then his next move will be to advertise Jim, or something like that. So we can't rest being as long digging him out as we ought to. By rights, I reckon we ought to be a couple of years. But we can't. Things being so uncertain, what I recommend is this, that we really dig right in as quick as we can, and after that we can let on to ourselves that we was at it thirty-seven years. Then we can satch him out and rush him away the first time there is an alarm. Yes, I reckon that'll be the best way. Now there's sense in that, I says. Letting on don't cost nothing. Letting on ain't no trouble. And if it's any object, I don't mind letting on we was at a hundred and fifty year. It wouldn't strain me none, after I got my hand in. So I'll mosey along now, and smudge a couple of case knives. Smudge three, he says. We want one to make a saw out of. Tom. If it ain't unregular and irreligious to suggest it, I says, there's an old rusty saw blade around yonder sticking under the weather boarding behind the smokehouse. He looked kind of weary and discouraged alike, and says, it ain't no use to try to learn you nothing, Huck. Run along and smudge the knives. Three of them. So I done it. Chapter 36 as soon as we reckoned everybody well as asleep that night, we went down the light nimrod and shut ourselves up in the lean-to and got out our pile of fox-fire and went to work. We cleared everything out of the way 
about four or five foot along the middle of the bottom log. Tom said he was right behind Jim's bed now, and we'd dig in under it, and when we got through there couldn't nobody in the cabin ever know there was any hole there, because Jim's counterpin hung down most to the ground, and you have to raise it up and look under to see the hole. So we dug and dug with the case knives till most midnight, and then we was dog-tired, and our hands was blistered, and yet you couldn't see we'd done anything hardly. At last I says, This ain't no thirty-seven-year job. This is a thirty-eight-year job, Tom Sawyer. He never said nothing, but he sighed, and pretty soon he stopped digging, and then for a good little while I knowed that he was thinking. Then he says, It ain't no use, Huck. It ain't a going to work. If we was prisoners, it would, because then we have as many years as we wanted, and no hurry. And we wouldn't get but a few minutes to dig every day while there was changing watches, and so our hands wouldn't get blistered, and we could keep it up right along year in and year out, and do it right, and the way it ought to be done. But we can't fool along. We got to rush. We ain't got no time to spare. If we was to put in another night, this way we have to knock off for a week to let our hands get well. Couldn't touch a case knife with them sooner. Well, then, what we going to do, Tom? I'll tell you. It ain't right, and it ain't moral, and I wouldn't like it to get out. But there ain't only just the one way. We got to dick him out with the picks and let on its case knives. Now you're talking, I says. Your head gets leveler and leveler all the time. Tom Sawyer, I says. Picks is the thing moral or no moral. And as for me, I don't care shucks for the morality of it, no. When I start in to steal a nigger or a watermelon or a Sunday school book, I ain't no ways particular how it's done so it's done. What I want is my nigger or what I want is my watermelon, or what I want is my Sunday school book. And if a pick's the handiest thing, that's the thing I'm a-going to dig that nigger or that watermelon or that Sunday school book out with, and I don't give a dead rat what the authorities thinks about another. Well, he says there's excuse for picks and letting on in a case like this. If it weren't so, I wouldn't approve of it, nor I wouldn't stand by and see the rules broke, because right is right and wrong is wrong, and a body ain't got no business doing wrong when he ain't ignorant and knows better. It might answer for you to dig Jim out with a pick, without any letting on, because you don't know no better. But it wouldn't for me, because I do know better. Give me a case knife. He had his own by him, but I handed him mine. He flummed down and says, Give me a case knife. I didn't know just what to do, but then I thought. I scratched around amongst the old pools and got a pickaxe and give it to him, and he took it and went to work and never said a word. He was always just that particular, full of principle. So then I got a shovel, and then we picked and shoveled, turn about, and made the fur fly. We stuck to it about a half an hour, which was as long as we could stand up. But we had a good deal of a hole to show for it. When I got upstairs, I looked out at the window and see Tom doing his level best with the lightning rod, but he couldn't come it. His hands was so sore. At last, he says, It ain't no use. It can't be done. What you reckon I better do? Can't you think of no way? Yes, I says, but I reckon it ain't regular. Come up the stairs and let on it's a lightning rod. So he done it. Next day Tom stole a pewter spoon and a brass candlestick in the house for to make some pens for Jim out of, and six tallow candles. And I hung around the knitter cabins and laid for a chance, and stole three tin plates. Tom says it wasn't enough. But I said nobody wouldn't ever see the plates that Jim throwed out, because they'd fall in the dog fennel and jimson weeds under the window hall. 
then we could tote them back, and he could use them over again. So Tom was satisfied. Then he says, Now, the thing to study out is how to get the things to Jim. Kick him in through the hole, I says, when we get it done. He only just looked scornful and said something about nobody ever heard of such an idiotic idea. And then he went to studying. By and by he said he had sifted out two or three ways, but there weren't no need to decide on any of them yet. Said we'd got to post Jim first. That night we went down the lightning rod a little after Chan and took one of the candles along and listened under the window hole and heard Jim snoring. So we pitched it in, and it didn't wake him. Then we whirled in with the pick and shovel, and in about two hours and a half the job was done. We crept in under Jim's bed and into the cabin, and pawed around and found the candle and lit it, and stood over Jim a while, and found him looking hearty and healthy, and then we woke him up gentle and gradual. He was so glad to see us he most cry, and called us honey and all the pet names he could think of, and was for having us hunt up a cold chisel to cut the chain off of his leg with right away, and clearing out without losing any time. But Tom, he showed him how unregular it would be, and sat down and told him all about our plans, and how we could alter them in a minute any time. There was an alarm, and not to be the least afraid, because we would see he got away, sure, so jim he said it was all right and we sat there and talked over old times a while and then tom asked a lot of questions and when jim told him uncle silas come in every day or to to pray with him and had sally come in to see if he was comfortable and had plenty to eat and both of them was kind as they could be tom says now i know how to fix it we'll send you some things by them I said, don't do nothing of the kind. It's one of the most jackass ideas I ever struck. But he never paid no attention to me. Went right on. It was his way when he'd got his plan set. So he told Jim how we'd have to smuggle in the rope ladder pie and other large things by Nat, the nigger that fed him, and he must be on the lookout, and not be surprised, and not let Nat see him open them and we would put small things in uncle's coat pockets and he must steal them out and we would tie things to aunt's apron strings or put them in her apron pocket if we got a chance and told him what they would be and what they was for and told him how to keep a journal on the shirt with his blood and all that he told him everything jim he couldn't see no sense in the most of it but he allowed we was white folks and no better than him so he was satisfied, and said he would do it all just as Tom said. Jim had plenty corn cup pipes and tobacco, so we had a right down good sociable time. Then we crawled out through the hole, and so home to bed, with hands that looked like they'd been chained. Tom was in high spirits. He said it was the best fun he ever had in his life, and the most intellectual and said if he only could see his way to it we would keep it up all the rest of our lives and leave jim to our children to get out for he believed jim would come to like it better and better the more he got used to it he said that in that way it could be strung out to as much as eighty year and would be the best time on record and he said it would make us all celebrated that had a hand in it in the morning we went out to the woodpile and chopped up the brass candlestick into handy sizes, and Tom put them and the pewter spoon in his pocket. Then we went to the nigger cabins, and while I got Nat's notice off, Tom shoved a piece of candlestick into the middle of a corn pun that was in Jim's pan, and we went along with Nat to see how it would work, and it just worked noble. When Jim bit into it, it most mash all his teeth out and there warn't ever anything could a worked better. Tom said so himself. Jim, he never let on but what it was only just a piece of rock, or something like that that's always getting into bread, you know. But after that he never bit into nothing, but what he jabbed his fork into it in three or four places first. 
and whilst we was ascending there in the dimish light here comes a couple of the hounds bulging in from under jim's bed and they kept on piling until there was eleven of them and there warn't hardly room in there to get your breath by jings we forgot to fasten that lean to door the nigger net he only just hollered which is once and heeled over on to the floor amongst the dogs and begun to groan like he was dying tom jerked the door open and flung out a slab of jim's meat and the dogs went for it and into seconds he was out himself and back again and shut the door and i know he fixed the other door too then he went to work on the nigger coaxing him and petting him and asking him if he'd been imagining he saw something again he raised up and blinked his eyes around and says mar sid you'll say i's a fool but if i didn't believe i see most a million dogs or devils or some i wished i made i right heeg in dis tracks i did ma strully mar sid i felt um i felt um saw it they was all over me dab fetch it i jeez wished i could get my hands on water dem which is jeez wanst on the jeez wanst it's all i asked but mostly i wished dade lem alone i does tom says well i tell you what i think what makes them come here just at this runaway nader's breakfast time it's because they're hungry that's the reason you make them a witch pie that's the thing for you to do but my land mar said how's i gwine to make em a witch pie i don't know how to make it i hain't ever heard her such a thing before well then i'll have to make it myself will you do it honey will you i'll wash up de ground on de foot i will all right i'll do it seeing it's you and you've been good to us and showed us the runaway nigger but you got to be mighty careful when we come around you turn your back and then whatever we've put in the pan don't you let on you see it at all and don't you look when jim unloads the pan something might happen i don't know what and above all don't you handle the witch things and on bar said what is you a talkin bout i wouldn't lay de weight or my finger on um not for ten hund thousand billion dollars i wouldn't chapter thirty seven that was all fixed so then we went away and went to the rubbish pile in the back yard where they keep the old boots and rags and pieces of bottles and wore out tin things and all such truck and scratched around and found an old tin washpin and stopped up the holes as well as we could to bake the pie in and took it down cellar and stole it full of flour and started for breakfast and found a couple of shingle mails that tom said would be handy for a prisoner to scrabble his name and sorrows on the dungeon walls with and dropped one of them in aunt sally's apron pocket which was hanging on a chair and t'other we stuck in the band of uncle silas's hat which was on the bureau because we heard the children say their pa and ma was going to the runaway nader's house this morning and then went to breakfast and tom dropped the pewter spoon in uncle silas's coat pocket and aunt sally wasn't come yet so we had to wait a little while and when she come she was hot and red and cross and couldn't hardly wait for the blessing and then she went to sluicing out coffee with one hand and cracking the handiest child's head with her thimble with the other and says i've hunted high and i've hunted low and it does beat all what has become of your other shirt my heart fell down amongst my lungs and livers and things and a hard piece of corn crust started down my throat after it and got met on the road with a cough and was shot across the table and took one of the children in the high and curled him up like a fishing worm and let a cry out of him the size of a warku and tom he turned kinder blue around the gills and it all amounted to a considerable state of things for about a quarter of a minute or as much as that and i would a sold out for half price if there was a bidder but after that we was all right again it was the sudden surprise of it that knocked us so kind of cold 
Uncle Silas, he says, It's most uncommon curious. I can't understand it. I know perfectly well I took it off, because, because you hain't got but one on. Just listen at the man. I know you took it off, and know it by a better way than your wool-gathering memory, too, because it was on the silo's line yesterday. I see it there myself. But it's gone. That's the long and the short of it. And you'll just have to change to a rent flannel one till I can get time to make a new one. And it'll be the third I've made in two years. It just keeps a body on the jump to keep you in shirps. And whatever you do manage to do with mole is more'n I can make out. A body think you would learn to take some sort of care of him at your time of life. I know it, Sally, and I do try all I can. But it oughtn't to be altogether my fault, because you know I don't see em nor have nothing to do with them except when they're on me. And I don't believe I've ever lost one of them off of me. Well, it ain't your fault if you haven't, Silas. You'd a done it if you could, I reckon. And the shirt ain't all that's gone, nother. There's a spoon gone. And that ain't all. There was ten, and now there's only nine. The calf got the shirt, I reckon, but the calf never took the spoon, that's certain. Why, what else is gone, Sally? There's six candles gone, that's what. The racks could have got the candles, and I reckon they did. I wonder they don't walk off with the whole place, but we are always going to stop their holes and don't do it. And if they weren't fools, they'd sleep in your hair, Silas. You'd never find it out. But you can't lay the spoon on the racks, and that I know. Well, Sally, I'm in fault, and I acknowledge it. I've been remiss. But I won't let tomorrow go by without stopping up the holes. Oh, I wouldn't hurry. Next year'll do. Matilda Angelina Araminta Feltz. Whack comes the thimble, and the child snatches her claws out of the sugar bowl without fooling around any. Just then the nigger woman steps onto the passage and says, Mrs. Day's a sheet gone. A sheet gone. Well, for the land's sake. I'll stop up them poles today, says Uncle Silas, looking sorrowful. Oh, do shut up. Suppose the rats took the sheet? Where's it gone, lies? Claw to goodness I hanged. No notion, Miss Sally. She was on de close line yesterday, but she done gone. She ain't done no mo now. I reckon the world is coming to an end. I never see the beat of it in all my born days. A shirt, and a sheet, and a swoon, and six can. Mrs. comes a young yeller wench. Days a brass cannel stick missin'. Glur out from here, you hussy, or I'll take a skillet to ye. Well, she was just a biling. I begun to lay for a chance. I reckoned I would sneak out and go for the woods till the weather moderated. She kept a raging right along, running her insurrection all by herself, and everybody else mighty meek and quiet. And at last, Uncle Silas looking kind of foolish, fishes up that spoon out of his pocket. She stopped with her mouth open and her hands up. And as for me, I wished I was in Jerusalem or somewheres. But not long, because she says, It's just as I expected. So you had it in your pocket all the time. And like as not you've got the other things there, too. How'd it get there? I really don't know, Sally. He says, kind of apologizing, or you know, I would tell. I was a studying over my text in Acts 17 before breakfast, and I reckon I put it in there, not noticing, meaning to put my testament in, and it must be so, because my testament ain't in. But I'll go and see. And if the testament is where I had it, I'll know why I didn't put it in, and that will show that I laid the testament down and took up the spoon. And, oh, for the land's sake, he of a body arrest. Go long now, 
the whole kit and biling of ye and don't come nigh me again till i've got back my peace of mind i'd a heard her if she'd a said it to herself let alone speaking it out and i'd a got up and obeyed her if i'd a been dead as we was passing through the setting-room the old man he took up his hat and the shingle mail fell out on the floor and he just merely picked it up and laid it on the mantel shelf and never said nothing then went out tom see him do it and remembered about the spoon and says well it ain't no use to send things by him no more he ain't reliable then he says but he done us a good turn with the spoon anyway without knowing it and so we'll go and do him one without him knowing it stop up his rat holes there was a noble good lot of them down cellar and it took us a whole hour but we done the job tight and good and ship shaped then we heard steps on the stairs and blowed out our light and hid and here comes the old man with a candle in one hand and a bundle of stuff in t'other looking as absent-minded as year before last he went a mooning around first to one rat hole and then another till he'd been to them all then he stood about five minutes picking tallow drip off of his candle and thinking then he turns off slow and dreamy towards the stairs saying well for the life of me i can't remember when i'd done it i could show her now that i weren't to blame on account of the rats but never mind let it go i reckon it wouldn't do no good and so he went on a mumbling upstairs and then we left he was a mighty nice old man and always is tom was a good deal bothered about what to do for a spoon but he said we'd got to have it so he took a think when he had ciffered it out he told me how we was to do then we went and waited around the spoon basket till we see aunt sally coming and then tom went to counting the spoons and laying them out to one side and i slid one of them up my sleeve and tom says why aunt sally there ain't but nine spoons yet she says go along to your plate and don't bother me i know better i counted myself well i've counted them twice auntie and i can't make but nine she looked out of all patience but of course she come to count anybody would i declare to gracious there ain't but nine she says why what in the world plague take the things i'll count em again so i slipped back the one i had and when she got done counting she says hang the troublesome rubbage there's ten now and she looked huffy and bothered both but tom says why auntie i don't think there's ten you numbskull didn't you see me count them i know but well i'll count them again so i smudged one and they come out nine same as the other time well she was in a tearing way just a trembling all over she was so mad but she counted and counted till she got that addle cheat start to count in the basket for a spoon sometimes and so three times they come out right and three times they come out wrong then she grabbed up the basket and slammed it across the house and knocked the cat galley west and she said clear out and let her have some peace and if we come bothering around her again betwixt that end dinner she'd skin us so we had the odd spoon and dropped it in her apron pocket whilst she was a-giving us our sailing orders and jim got it all right along with her shingle nail before noon we was very well satisfied with this business and tom allowed it was worth twice the trouble it took because he said now she couldn't ever count them spoons twice alike again to save her life and wouldn't believe she'd counted them right if she did and said that after she'd about counted her head off for the next three days he judged she'd give it up and offer to kill anybody that wanted her to ever count them any more so we put the sheet back on the line that night and stole one out of her closet and kept on putting it back and stealing it again for a couple of days 
till she didn't know how many sheets she had any more, and she didn't care, and mourned at going to bull-rent the rest of her soul out about it, and wouldn't count them again, not to save her life. She'd rather die first. So we was all right now, as to the shirt, and the sheet, and the spoon, and the candles, by the help of the calf, and the rats, and the mixed up counting. And as to the candlestick, it warned no consequence that it would blow over by and by. But that pie was a job. We had no end of trouble with that pie. We fixed it up way down in the woods, and cooked it there, and we got it done at last, and very satisfactory, too. But not all in one day. And we had to use up three washpans full of flour before we got through, and we got burnt pretty much all over it in places, and ice put out with the smoke. Because, you see, we didn't want nothing but a crust, and we couldn't prep it up right, and she would always cave in. But, of course, we thought of the right way at last, which was to cook the latter, too, in the pie. So then we laid in with Jim the second night, and tore up the sheet all in little strings and twisted them together, and long before daylight we had a lovely rope that you could hung a person with. We let on it took nine months to make it. And in the forenoon we took it down to the woods, but it wouldn't go into the pie. Being made of a whole sheet, that way there was rope enough for forty pies if we'd wanted them, and plenty left over for soup or sausage or anything you choose. We could have had a whole dinner. But we didn't need it. All we needed was just enough for the pie, and so we throw the rest away. We didn't cook none of the pies in the wash pan, afraid the solder would melt. But Uncle Silas, he had a noble brass warming pan, which he thought considerable of, because it belonged to one of his ancestors with a long wooden handle, that come over from England with William the Conqueror in the Mayflower, or one of them early ships, and was hid away up garret with a lot of other old pots, and things that was valuable, not on account of being any account, because they weren't, but on account of them being relics, you know, and we slicked her out, private, and took her down there. Uh, she failed on the first pies, because we didn't know how, but she come up smiling on the last one. We took and lined her with dough, and set her in the coals, and loaded her up with rag rope, and put on a dough roof, and shut down the lid, and put hot embers on top, and stood off five foot, with the long handle, cool and comfortable, and in fifteen minutes she turned out a pie that was a satisfaction to look at. But the person that at it would want to fetch a couple of cags of toothpicks along, for if that rope letter wouldn't cramp him down to business, I don't know nothing what I'm talking about, and lay him in enough stomach ache to last him till next time, too. It didn't look when we put the witch pie in Jim's pan, and we put the three tin plates in the bottom of the pan under the vittles, and so Jim got everything all right, and as soon as he was by himself, he busted into the pie and hid the rope ladder inside of his straw tick and scratched some marks on a tin plate, and throwed it out of the window hole. Chapter 38 Making them pens was a distressed tough job, and so was the sot, and Jim allowed the inscription was going to be the toughest of all. That's the one which the prisoner has to scrabble on the wall. But he had to have it. Tom said he'd got to. There weren't no case of a state prisoner not scrabbling his inscription to leave behind and his coat of arms. Look at Lady Jane Grey, he says. Look at Guilford Dudley. Look at old Northumberland. Why, Huck, suppose it is considerable trouble. What you going to do? How you going to get around it? Jim's got to do his inscription and coat of arms. They all do. Jim says. Why, Mars Tom, I hain't got no coat o arm. I hain't got nothin' a dish your old shirt, and you knows I got to keep de journal on dat. Oh, you don't understand, Jim. A coat of arms is very different. Well, I says Jim's right. 
anyway when he says he ain't got no coat of arms because he hain't i reckon i know that tom says but you bet he'll have one before he goes out of this because he's going out right and there ain't going to be no flaws in his record so a whilst me and jim filed away at the pens on a brick bit apiece jim a making his out of the brass and i making mine out of the spoon tom set to work to think out the coat of arms by and by he said he'd struck so many good ones he didn't hardly know which to take but there was one which he reckoned he'd decide on he says on the scutcheon we'll have a bend or in the dexter base a saltire murray in the fess with a dog couchant for common charge and under his foot a chain embattled for slavery with a chevron vert in a chief in grail and three invected lines on a field asher with the nombral points rampant on a dance indented crest a runaway nigger sable with his bundle over his shoulder on a bar sinister and a couple gills for supporters which is you and me motto major frete minor etto got it out of a book means the more haste the less speed Jewelkins, i says but what does the rest of it mean we ain't but no time to bother over that he says we got to did in like all bit out well anyway i says what's some of it what's a fess a fess a fest is you don't need to know what a fess is i'll show him how to make it when he gets to it shucks tom i says i think you might tell a person what's a bar sinister oh i don't know but he's got to have it all the nobility does that was just his way if it didn't suit him to explain a thing to you he wouldn't do it you might pump at him a week it wouldn't make no difference he got all that coat of arms business fixed so now he started in to finish up the rest of that part of the work which was to plan out a mournful inscription said jim got to have one like they all done he made up a lot and wrote them out on a paper and read them off so one here a captive heart busted two here a poor prisoner forsook by the world and friends fretted his sorrowful life three here a lonely heart broke and a worn spirit went to its rest after thirty-seven years of solitary captivity four here homeless and friendless after thirty-seven years of bitter captivity perished a noble stranger natural son of louis fourteen tom's voice trembled whilst he was reading them and he most broke down when he got done he couldn't no way make up his mind which one for jim to scrabble on to the wall they was all so good but at last he allowed he would let him scrabble them all on jim said it would take him a year to scrabble such a lot of truck on to the logs with a nail and he didn't know how to make letters besides but tom said he would block them out for him and then he wouldn't have nothing to do but just follow the lines then pretty soon he says come to think the logs ain't a going to do they don't have log walls in a dungeon we got to dig b inscriptions into a rock we'll fetch a rock jim said the rock was worse than the logs he said it would take him such a pissin long time to dig them into a rock he wouldn't ever get out but tom said he would let me help him do it then he took a look to see how me and jim was getting along with the pens it was most pesky tedious hard work and slow and didn't give my hands no show to get well of the sores and we didn't seem to make no headway hardly so tom says i know how to fix it we got to have a rock for the coat of arms and mournful inscriptions and we can kill two birds with that same rock there's a gaudy big grindstone down at the mill and we'll smutch it and carve the things on it and file out the pens and the saw on it too it warmed no slouch of an idea and it warned no slouch of a grindstone nutter but we allowed we'd tackle it 
it warn't quite made night yet so we cleared out for the mill leaving jim at work we smouched the grindstone and set out to roll her home but it was a most nation tough job sometimes do what we could we couldn't keep her from falling over and she come mighty near mashing us every time tom said she was going to get one of us sure before we got through we got her halfway and then we was plumb played out and most drowned with sweat we see it warn't no use we got to go and fetch jim so he raised up his bed and slid the chain off of the bed leg and wrapped it round and round his neck and we crawled out through our hole and down there and jim and me laid into that grindstone and walked her along like nothing and tom superintended he could out superintend any boy i ever see he knowed how to do everything our hole was pretty big but it warn't big enough to get the grindstone through but jim he took the pick and soon made it big enough then tom marked at them things on it with the nail and set jim to work on them with the nail for a chisel and an iron bolt from the rubbish in the lean-to for a hammer and told him to work till the rest of his candle quit on him and then he could go to bed and hide the grindstone under his straw tick and sleep on it then we helped him fixed his chain back on the bed leg and was ready for bed ourselves but tom thought of something and says you got any spiders in here jim no saw so thanks to goodness i hanged mars tom all right we'll get you some but bless you honey i don't want none ice if er done on i dis soon have rattlesnakes around tom thought a minute or two and says it's a good idea and i reckon it's been done it must have been done it stands to reason yes it's a prime good idea where could you keep it keep what mars tom why a rattlesnake de goodness gracious alive mars tom why if day was a rattlesnake to come in he i'd take in bust right out through dat law ball i would wid my head why jim you wouldn't be afraid of it after a little you could tame it tame it yes easy enough every animal is grateful for kindness and petting and they wouldn't think of hurting a person that pets them a book will tell you that you try that's all i asked just try for two or three days why you can get him so in a little while that he'll love you and sleep with you and won't stay away from you a minute and will let you wrap him round your neck and put his head in your mouth please mars tom don't talk so i can't stand it he let me shove his head in my mouth for a favor hain't eight i lay he'd wait a powerful long time for i asked him and mo and da i don't want him to sleep with me jim don't act so foolish a prisoner's bought to have some kind of a dumb pet and if a rattlesnake hain't ever been tried why there's more glory to be gained in your being the first to ever try it than any other way you could ever think of to save your life why bars tom i don't want no sich glory snake taken by jim's chin off dan why is de glory no sir i don't want no sich doings lame it can't you try i only want you to try you needn't keep it up if it don't work but de trouble all done if de snake ite me while i's a trying him mars tom i's willin to tackle moss anything it ain't unreasonable but if you and huck fetches a rattles made and he for me to tame i's gwine to leave dat's sure well men let it go let it go if you are so bull-headed about it we can get you some carter snakes and you can tie some buttons on their tails and let on their rattlesnakes and i reckon that'll have to do i can stand dem mars tom but blame if i couldn't get along with dat tom i tell you dat 
I never knowed foot was so much bother and trouble to be a prisoner. Well, it always is when it's done right. You got any rats around here? No, sir, I hain't seed none. Well, we'll get you some rats. Why, Mars Tom, I don't want no rats. Bays de dab lamedest pritchers to stir a body, un rustle round over him, and bite his feet when he's trying to sleep, I ever see. No, sir, gimme me theater snakes. F I's got to have em, but don't gimme me no rats. I hang dot no use for un scarcely. But, Jim, you got to have him. They all do. So don't make no more fuss about it. Prisoners ain't ever without rats. There ain't no instance of it. And they train them, and pet them, and learn them tricks. And they get to be as sociable as flies. But you got to play music to them. You got anything to play music on? I ain't got nothing but a coast comb and a piece of paper and a juice harp. But I reckon day it wouldn't take no stock in a juice harp. Yes, they would. They don't care what kind of music is. A juice harp's plenty good enough for a rat. All animals like music. In a prison they go on it. Specially painful music. And you can't get no other kind out of a juice harp. It always interests them. They come out to see what's the matter with you. Yes, you are all right. You are fixed very well. You want to set on your bed nights before you go to sleep, and early in the mornings, and play your juice hark. Play the last link is broken. That's the thing that'll scoop a rat quicker than anything else. And when you've played about two minutes, you will see all the rats, and the snakes, and spiders, and things begin to feel worried about you, and come. And they'll just fairly swarm over you, and have a noble good time. Yes, day will, I reckon, Mars Tom. But what kinder time is Jim havin? Blessed if I can see de pint. But I'll do it if I got to. I reckon I better keep de animals satisfied and not have no trouble in de house. Tom waited to think it over and see if there wasn't nothing else. And pretty soon he says, Oh, there is one thing I forgot. Could you raise a flower here, do you reckon? I don't know, but maybe I could. Mars Tom. But it's tollable dark, and he and I ain't got no use for no flower. No, how, and she'd be a powerful sight of trouble. Well, you try it anyway. Some other prisoners has done it. One or a damn big cat tail look in mullen stalks would grow in he. Mars Tom, I reckon but she wouldn't be with half de trouble she'd pass. Don't you believe it? We'll fetch you a little one, and you plant it in the corner over there, and raise it. And don't call it Mullen, call it Kitchilla. That's its right name when it's in a prison. And you want to water it with your tears. Why, I got plenty spring water, Mars Tom. You don't want spring water. You want to water it with your tears. It's the way they always do. Why, Mars Tom, I lay I can raise one or dem mullen stalks twist with spring water whiles another man's a startin one wid tears. That ain't the idea. You got to do it with tears. She'll die on my hands, Mars Tom, she surely will. Case I don't spacely ever cry. So Tom was stumped. But he studied it over, and then said Jim would have to worry along the best he could with an onion. He promised he would go to the nigger cabins and drop one, private, in Jim's coffee pot in the morning. Jim said he would just as soon have to back her in his coffee, and found so much fault with it, and with the work and bother of raising the mullen, and Jews harping the rats, and petting and flattering up the snakes and spiders and things on top of all the other work he had to do on pens and inscriptions and journals and things which made it more trouble and worry and responsibility to be a prisoner than anything he ever undertook that tom most lost all patience with him 
and said he was just loaded down with more gaudy chances than a prisoner ever had in the world to make a name for himself, and yet he didn't know enough to appreciate them, and they was just about wasted on him. So Jim he was sorry, and said he wouldn't be hey so no more, and then me and Tom shook for bed. Chapter 13 In the morning we went up to the village and bought a wire rat trap, and fetched it down, and unstopped the best rat hole, and in about an hour we had fifteen of the bulliest kind of ones. And then we took it and put it in a safe place under Aunt Sally's bed. But while it was gone for spiders, little Thomas Franklin, Benjamin Jefferson, Alexander Phelps found it there, and opened the door of it to see if the rats would come out. And they did. And Aunt Sally, she come in, and when we got back, she was a standing on top of the bed raising cane and the rats was doing what they could to keep off the dull times for her. So she took and dusted us both with the hickory, and we was as much as two hours catching another fifteen or sixteen drat that meddlesome cub, and they weren't the likeliest, nother, because the first haul was the pick of the flock. I never see a likelier lot of rats than what that first haul was. We got a splendid stock of sorted spiders and bugs and frogs and caterpillars and one thing or another. And we liked to got a hornet's nest, but we didn't. The family was at home. We didn't give it right up, but stayed with them as long as we could. Because we allowed we'd tire them out, or they'd got to tire us out. And they'd done it. Then we got a la campaign and rugged on the places, and was pretty near all right again, but couldn't sit down convenient. And so we went for the snakes, and grabbed a couple of dozen garters and house snakes, and put them in a bag, and put it in our room, and by that time it was supper time, and a rattling good honest day's work, and hungry. Oh, no, I reckon not. And there weren't a blessed snake up there when we went back. We didn't have to have a sack, and they worked out somehow, and left. But it didn't matter much, because they were still on the premises somewheres. So we judged we could get some of them again. No, there weren't no real scarcity of snakes about the house for a considerable spell. You'd see them dripping from the rafters and places every now and then. And they generally landed in your plate or down the back of your neck, and most of the time where you didn't want them. Well, they was handsome and striped and there weren't no harm in a million of them. But that never made no difference to Aunt Sally. She despised snakes be the breed what they might, and she couldn't stand them no way you could fix it. And every time one of them flopped down on her, it didn't make no difference what she was doing. She would just lay that work down and light out. I never see such a woman. And you could hear her hoop to Jericho. You couldn't get her to take a hold of one of them with the tongs. And if she turned over and found one in bed, she would scramble out and lift a howl that you would think the house was a fire. She disturbed the old man so that he said he could most wish there hadn't ever been no snakes created. Why, after every last snake had been gone cleared out of the house for as much as a week, Aunt Sally warned over it yet. She warned near over it. When she was setting thinking about something, you could touch her on the back of her neck with a feather, and she would jump right out of her stockings. It was very curious. But Tom said all women was just so. He said they was made that way for some reason or other. We got a licking every time one of our snakes come in her way, and she allowed these lickings weren't nothing to what she would do if we ever loaded up the place again with them. I didn't mind the lickings because they didn't amount to nothing. But I minded the trouble we had to lay in another lot. But we got them laid in, and all the other things. And you never see a cabin as blithesome as Jim's was when they all swarm out for music and go for him. Jim didn't like the spiders, and the spiders didn't like Jim. And so they'd lay for him, and make it mighty warm for him and he said that between the rats and the snakes and the grindstone there weren't no room in bed for him scarcely and when there was a body couldn't sleep it was so lively 
and it was always lively, he said, because they never all slept at one time, but took turn about. So when the snakes was asleep, the rats was on deck, and when the rats turned and the snakes come on watch. So he always had one gang under him, in his way, and t'other gang having a circus over him. And if he got up to hunt a new place, the spiders would take a chance at him as he crossed over. He said if he ever got out this time, he wouldn't ever be a prisoner again. Not for a salary. Well, by the end of three weeks, everything was in pretty good shape. The shirt was sent in early, in a pie, and every time a rat bit Jim, he would get up and write a little in his journal whilst the ink was fresh. The pens was made, the inscriptions, and so on was all carved on the grindstone. The bed lead was sawed in two, and we had et up the sawdust, and it give us a most amazing stomach ache. We reckoned we was all going to die, but didn't. It was the most unadjustable sawdust I ever see, and Tom said the same. But, as I was saying, we'd got all the work done now, at last. And we was all pretty much fatted out, too, but mainly Jim. The old man had wrote a couple of times to the plantation below Orleans to come and get their runaway neighbor, but hadn't got no answer, because there weren't no such plantation. So he allowed he would advertise Jim in the Saint, Louis, and New Orleans papers. And when he mentioned the Saint, Louis ones that give me the cold shivers, and I see we hadn't no time to lose. So Tom said, Now for the anonymous letters. What's them? I says. Warnings to the people that something is up. Sometimes it's done one way, sometimes another. But there's always somebody spying around that gives notice to the governor of the castle. When Louis said I was going to light out of the Tuileries, a servant girl done it. It's a very good way, and so is the anonymous letters. We'll use them both and it's usual for the prisoner's mother to change clothes with him, and she stays in, and he slides out in her clothes. We'll do that, too. But looky here, Tom. What do we want to warn anybody for that something's up? Let them find it out for themselves. It's their lookout. Yes, I know. But you can't depend on them. It's the way they'd act it from the very start left us to do everything. They're so confiding and mullet-headed they don't take notice of nothing at all. So if we don't give them notice, there won't be nobody nor nothing to interfere with us. And so after all our hard work and trouble, this escape will go off perfectly flat. Won't amount to nothing. Won't be nothing to it. Well, as for me, Tom, that's the way I'd like. Shucks he says, and looked disgusted. So I says, but I ain't going to make no complaint. Any way that suits you suits me. What you going to do about the servant girl? You'll be her. You slide in, in the middle of the night, and hook that young girl's frock. Why, Tom, that'll make trouble next morning. Because, of course, she probably hain't thought any but that one. I know, but you don't want it but fifteen minutes to carry the anonymous letter and shove it under the front door. All right, then, I'll do it, but I could carry it just as handy in my own togs. You wouldn't look like a servant girl then, would you? Well, but there won't be nobody to see what I look like, anyway. That ain't got nothing to do with it. The thing for us to do is just to do our duty, and not worry about whether anybody sees us do it or not. Ain't you got no principle at all? All right, I ain't saying nothing. I'm the servant girl. Who's Jim's mother? I'm his mother. I'll hook a gown from Aunt Sally. Well, then, you'll have to stay in the cabin when me and Jim leaves. Not much. I'll stuff Jim's clothes full of straw and lay it on his bed to represent his mother in disguise. And Jim will take the nigger woman's gown off of me and wear it, and we'll all evade together. When a prisoner of style escapes, it's called an evasion. 
this always called so when a king escapes for instance and the same with the king's son it don't make no difference whether he's a natural one or an unnatural one so tom he wrote the anonymous letter and i smudged the yaller wench's frock that night and put it on and shoved it under the front door the way tom told me to it said the where trouble is brewing keep a sharp lookout unknown friend next night we stuck a picture which tom drawed in blood of a skull and crossbones on the front door and next night another one of a coffin on the back door i never see a family in such a sweat they couldn't have been worth scared if the place had been full of ghosts laying for them behind everything and under the beds and shivering through the air if a door banged at sally she jumped and said ouch if anything fell she jumped and said ouch if you happened to touch her when she weren't noticing she done the same she couldn't face snowy and be satisfied because she allowed there was something behind her every time so she was always a whirling around sudden and saying ouch and before she'd got to thurs around she'd whirled back again and say again and she was afraid to go to bed but she dasn't set up so the thing was working very well tom said he said he never see a thing work more satisfactory he said it showed it was done right so he said now for the grand bulge so the very next morning at the streak of dawn we got another letter ready and was wondering what we'd better do with it because we heard them say at supper they was going to have a nigger on watch at both doors all night tom he went down the lightning rod to spy around and the nigger at the back door was asleep and he stuck it in the back of his neck and come back this letter said don't betray me i wish to be your friend there is a discreet gang of cutthroats from over in the indian territory going to steal your runaway nigger to-night and they have been trying to scare you so as you will stay in the house and not bother them i am one of the gang but have got religion and wish to quit it and lead an honest life again and will betray the hellish design they will sneak down from northards along the fence at midnight exact with a false key and go in the nigger's cabin to get him i am to be off a piece and blow a tin horn if i see any danger but stead of that i will be a like a sheep soon as they get in and not blow at all then whilst they are getting his chains loose you slip there and lock them in and can kill them at your leisure don't do anything but just the way i am telling you if you do they will suspicion something and raise coop jambry who i do not wish any reward but to know i have done the right thing unknown friend chapter forty we was feeling pretty good after breakfast and took my canoe and went over the river a fishing with a lunch and had a good time and took a look at the raft and found her all right and got home late to supper and found them in such a sweat and worry they didn't know which end they were standing on and made us go right off to bed the minute we was done supper and wouldn't tell us what the trouble was and never let on a word about the new letter but didn't need to because we knowed as much about it as anybody did and as soon as we was half upstairs and her back was turned we slid for the cellar cupboard and loaded up a good lunch and took it up to our room and went to bed and got up about half past eleven and tom put on ed sally's dress that he stole and was going to start with the lunch but says where's the butter i laid out a hunk of it i says on a piece of a corn pun well you left it laid out then it ain't here we can get along without it i says we can get along with it too he says just you slide down cellar and fetch it and then mosey right down the lightning rod and come along i'll go uh, and stuff the straw into jim's clothes to represent his mother in disguise and be ready to be like a sheep and should soon as you get there so out he went and down cellar went i the hunk of butter big as a person's fist was where i had left it so i took up the slab of corn pone with it on 
and blowed out my light and started upstairs very stealthy and got up to the main floor all right but here comes aunt sally with a candle and i clapped the truck in my hat and clapped my hat on my head and the next second she see me and she says you been down cellar yes what you been doing down there nothing nothing no well then what possessed you to go down there this time of night i don't know em. you don't know don't answer me that way tom i want to know what you've been doing down there i hain't been doing a single thing aunt sally i hope to gracious if i have i reckon she'd let me go now and as a general thing she would but i suppose there were so many strange things going on she was just in a sweat about every little thing that warn't yardstick straight so she says very decided you just march into that setting room and stay there till i come you been up to something you know business too and i lay i'll find out what it is before i am done with you so she went away as i opened the door and walked into the setting room my but there was a crowd there fifteen farmers and every one of them had a gun i was most powerful sick and slunk to a chair and sat down it was setting around some of them talking a little in a low voice and all of them fidgety and uneasy but trying to look like they weren't what i know it was because they was always taking off their hats and putting them on and scratching their heads and changing their seats and fumbling with their buttons i warn't easy myself but i didn't take my hat off all the same i did wish aunt sally would come and get done with me and lick me if she wanted to and let me get away and tell tom how we'd overdone this thing and what a thundering hornet's nest we got ourselves into so we could stop fooling around straight off and clear out with jim before these ricks got out of patience and come for us at last she come and begun to ask me questions but i couldn't answer them straight i didn't know which end of me was up because these men was in such a fidget now that some was wanting to start right now and lay for them desperados and saying it weren't but a few minutes to midnight and others was trying to get them to hold on and wait for the sheep signal and here was auntie pegging away at the questions and me a shaking all over and ready to sink down in my tracks i was that scared and the place getting hotter and hotter and the butter beginning to melt and run down my neck and behind my ears and pretty soon when one of them says i am for going and getting in the cabin first and right now and catching them when they come i most dropped and a streak of butter come a trickling down my forehead and aunt sally she see it and turns white as a sheet and says for the land's sake what is the matter with the child he's got the brain fever as sure as you're born and they're oozing out and everybody runs to see and she snatches off my hat and out comes the bread and what was left of the butter and she grabbed me and hugged me and says oh what a churn you did give me and how glad and grateful i am it ain't no worse for luck's against us and it never rains but it pours and when i see that truck i thought we'd lost you for i knowed by the color and all it was just like your brains would be if dear dear why didn't you tell me that was what you'd been down there for i wouldn't a cared now pour out to bed and don't let me see no more of you till morning i was upstairs in a second and down the lightning rod in another one and shinning through the dark for the lean to i couldn't hardly get my words out i was so anxious but i told tom as quick as i could we must jump for it now and not a minute to lose the house full of men yonder with buns his eyes just blazed and he says no is that so ain't it fully why huck if it was to do over again i bet i could fetch two hundred if we could put it off till 
Harry, Harry, I says. Where is Chin? Right at your elbow. If you reach out your arm, you can touch him. He's dressed and everything's ready. And we'll slide out and give the sheep signal. But then we heard the tramp of men coming to the door and heard them begin to fumble with the padlock and heard a man say, I told you we'd be too soon. They haven't come. The door is locked. Here, I'll lock some of you into the cabin, and you lay four of them in the dark and kill em when they come, and the rest scatter around a piece, and listen if you can hear em coming. So in they come, but couldn't see us in the dark, and most trod on us whilst we was hustling to get under the bed. But we got under all right, and out through the hole, swift but soft, Jim first, me next, and Tom last, which was according to Tom's orders. Now we was in the lean-to, and heard trampings close by it outside. So we crept to the door, and Tom stopped us there, and put his eye to the crack, but couldn't make out nothing, it was so dark, and whisper, and said he would listen for the steps to get further, and when he nudged us, Jim must glide out first, and him last. So he set his ear to the crack and listened, and listened, and listened, and the steps is scraping around out there all the time. And at last he nudged us, and we slid out, and souped down, not breathing and not making the least noise, and slipped stealthy towards the fence in injun file, and got to it all right, and me and Jim over it. But Tom's breeches cashed fast on a splinter on the top rail, and then he hear the steps coming, so he had to pull loose, which snapped the splinter and made a noise. And as he dropped in our tracks, and started somebody sings out, Who's that? Answer, or I'll shoot. But we didn't answer. We just unfurled our keels and shoved. Then there was a rush and a bang, 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 and the bullets fairly whiz around us. We heard them saying out, here they are. They've broke for the river. After him, boys, and turn loose the dogs. So here they come, full tilt. We could hear them, because they wore boots and yelled. But we didn't wear no boots and didn't yell. We was in the path to the mill. And when they got pretty close onto us, we dodged into the bush and let them go by, and then dropped in behind them. They'd had all the dogs shut up so they wouldn't scare off the robbers. But by this time somebody had let them loose, and here they come, making powwow enough for a million. But they was our dogs. So we stopped in our tracks till they catched up, and when they see it warn't nobody but us, and no excitement to offer them, they only just said howdy, and tore right ahead towards the shouting and clattering. And then we up steam again and whizzed along after them, till we was nearly to the mill, and then struck up through the bush, to where my canoe was tied, and hopped in and pulled for dear life towards the middle of the river, that didn't make no more noise than we was obliged to. Then we struck out, easy and comfortable, for the island where my raft was, and we could hear them yelling and barking at each other all up and down the bank, till we were so far away the sounds got dim and die out. And when we stepped onto the raft, I says, Now, old Jim, you're a free man again, and I beg you won't ever be a slave no more. And a mighty good job it was, too, Huck. It does plan beautiful, and it does done beautiful. And day ain't nobody can get up a plan dat's mo mixed up and splendid den what dat one woos. We was all glad as we could be, but Tom was the gladdest of all because he had a bullet in the calf of his leg. When me and Jin heard that we didn't feel so brash as what we did before, it was hurting him considerable and bleeding. So we laid him in the wigwam and tore up one of the dupe's shirt for to bandage him, but he says, Give me the reds. I can do it myself. Don't stop now. Don't fool round here, and the evasion booming long so handsome. Man the sweets, and set her loose. 
boys we done it elegant deed we did i wish we'd a had the handling of lewis vi there wouldn't a been no son of st lewis ascend to heaven wrote down in his biography no sir we'd a whooped him over the border that's what we'd a done with him and done it just as slip as nothing at all too man the sweeps man the sweeps but me and jim was consulting and thinking and after we'd fought a minute i says say it jim so he says well den dis is de way it looked to me uck if it woos him dad who's been sought free and one er de boys woos to get shot would he say go on and save me am in bout a doctor for to save dis one is dat like mars tom sawyer would he say dat you bet he wouldn't well um den's jim doin to say it no sir i don't budge a step out in dis place a doubted doctor not if it's forty year i knowed he was white in sight and i reckoned he'd say what he did say so it was all right now and i told tom i was a going for a doctor he raised considerable row about it but me and jim stuck to it and wouldn't budge so he was for crawling out and setting the raft loose himself but we wouldn't let him then he gave us a piece of his mind but it didn't do no good so when he sees me getting the canoe ready he says well then if you're bound to go i'll tell you the way to do when you get to the village shut the door and blindfold the doctor tight and fast and make him swear to be silent as the grave and put a purse full of gold in his hand and then take and lead him all around the back alleys and everywheres of the dark and then fetch him here in the canoe in a roundabout way amongst the islands and search him and take his chalk away from him and don't give it back to him till you get him back to the village or else he will chop this raft so he can find it again it's the way they all do so i said i would and left and jim was to hide in the woods and he see the doctor coming till he was gone again chapter forty one the doctor was an old man a very nice kind-looking old man when i got him up i told him me and my brother was over on spanish island hunting yesterday afternoon and camped on a piece of a raft we found and about midnight he must a kicked his gun in his dreams for it went off and shot him in the leg and we wanted him to go over there and fix it and not say nothing about it nor let anybody know because we wanted to come home this evening and surprise the folks who is your folks he says the phelpses down yonder oh he says and after a minute he says how'd you say he hot shot he had a dream i says and it shot him singular dream he says so he lit up his lantern and got his saddle bags and we started but when he sees the canoe he didn't like the look of her said she was big enough for one but didn't look pretty safe for two i says oh you needn't be afeard sir she carried the three of us easy enough what three why me and sid and 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 the guns that's what i mean oh he says but he put his foot on the vanel and rocked her and shook his head and said he reckoned he'd look around for a bigger one but they was all locked and chained so he took my canoe and said for me to wait till he come back or i could hunt around further or maybe i'd better go down home and get them ready for the surprise if i wanted to but i said i didn't so i told him just how to find the raft and then he started i struck an idea pretty soon i says to myself s'posin he can't fix that leg just in three shakes of a sheep's tail as the saying is s'posin it takes him three or four days what are we going to do lay around there till he lets the cat out of it back no sir i know what i'll do i'll wait and when he comes back if he says he's 
not to go any more i'll get down there too if i swim and we'll take and tie him and keep him and shove out down the river and when tom's done with him we'll give him what it's worth or all we got and then let him get ashore so then i crept into a lumber pile to get some sleep and next time i waked up the sun was away up over my head i shot out and went for the doctor's house but they told me he'd gone away in the night some time or other and weren't back yet well thinks i that looks powerful bad for tom and i'll dig out for the island right off so away i shoved and turned the corner and nearly rammed my head into uncle silas's stomach he says why tom where you been all this time you rascal i hang been nowheres i says only just hunting for the runaway nigger me and sid why wherever did you go he says your aunt's been mighty uneasy she needn't i says because we was all right we followed the men and the dogs but they outrun us and we lost them but we thought we heard them on the water so we got a canoe and took out after them and crossed over but couldn't find buffing of them so we cruised along up shore till we got kind of tired and beat out and tied up the canoe and went to sleep and never waked up till about an hour ago then we paddled over here to hear the news and sid's at the post office to see what he can hear and i'm a branching out to get something to eat for us and then we're going home so then we went to the post office to get sid but just as i suspicioned he warned bear so the old man he got a letter out of the office and we waited a while longer but sid didn't come so the old man said come along let sid foot it home or canoe it when he got done fooling around but we would ride i couldn't get him to let me stay and wait for sid and he said there warn't no use in it and i must hum along and let aunt sally see we was all right when we got home aunt sally was that glad to see me she laughed and cried both and hugged me and gave me one of them lickings of hern that don't amount to shucks and said she'd serve sid the same when he come and the place was plumb full of farmers and farmers wives to dinner and such another clack a body never heard old mrs hotchkiss was the worst her tongue was a-going all the time she says well, Sister Phelps, I've ransacked that air cabin over, and I believe the nigger was crazy. I says to Sister Damrell, didn't I, Sister Damrell? Sigh, he's crazy, sigh. Them's the very words, I said. You all hearn me, he's crazy, sigh. Everything shows it, sigh. Look at that air grindstone, sigh want to tell me any critters in his right minds are going to scrabble all them crazy things onto a grindstone say here sich and sich a person busted his heart and here so and so pegged along for thirty-seven year in all that natural son o lewis somebody den sich everlastin rubbage he's plumb crazy say it's what i says in the fust place it's what i says in the middle Dennis, what I says last and all the time. The nigger is crazy. Crazy, as Nebuchadnezzar, sigh. And look at that air ladder made out in rads. Sister Hotchkiss, says old Mrs. Damrell. What in the name o' oh goodness could he ever want of? The very word I was a saying no longer ago than this minute to Sister Utterbeck, then she'll tell you so herself. Essay she, look at that air rag ladder say she and sigh yes look at it sigh what could he have wanted of it sigh say she sister hotchkiss say she but how in the nation they ever get that grindstone in there anyway and who dug that er hole and who i very words bur penwald i was a same has that er sasser own lasses won't he i was a saying to sister dunlap just this minute how did they get that grindstone in there sigh without help mind you without help thars where tis 
don't tell me say there was help say and there was a plenty help too say there has been a dozen a helpin that eager and i lay i'd skin every last nigger on this place but i'd find out who done it sigh and moreover sigh a dozen says you forty couldn't a done everything that's been done look at them case knife saws and things how tedious they've been made look at that bed leg sawed off with em a week's work for six men look at that knitter made out in straw on the bed and look at you may well say it burr high tower it's just as i was a say to burr phelps his own self said what do you think of it sister hotchkiss said think o what burr phelps say think o that bed leg sawed off at a way say think of it say i lay it never sawed itself off say somebody sawed it say that's my opinion take it or leave it it mayn't be no count say but such as is it's my opinion say then if anybody can start a better one say let him do it say that's all i says to sister dunlap say why go my cats they must have been a house full o niggers in there every night for for weeks to a done all that work sister phelps look at that shirt every last inch of it kiver over with secret african reggin done with blood must have been a raft of em at it right along all the time umbos why i'd give two dollars to have it read to me and as for the niggers that wrote it i owe i take lash em tall people to help him brother marples well i reckon you'd think so if you'd have been in this house for a while back why they've stole everything they could lay their hands on and we're watching all the time mind you they stole that shirt right off o the line and as for the sheet they made the rag ladder out of there ain't no telling how many times they didn't steal that and flour and candles and candlesticks and spoons and the old warming pan and most a thousand things that i disremember now and my new calico dress and me and silas and my sade and tom on the constant watch day and night as i was a-telling you and not a one of us could catch hide nor hair nor sight nor sound of them and here at the last minute lo and behold you they slides right in under our noses and fools us and not only fools us but the injun territory robbers too and actually gets away with that neighbor safe and sound and that with sixteen men and twenty-two dogs right on their very heels at that very time i tell you it just bangs anything i ever heard o why spirits couldn't a done better and been no smarter and i reckon they must have been spirits because you know our dogs and there ain't no better well them dogs never even got on the track of em once you explain that to me if you can any of you well it does beat laws alive i never so help me i wouldn't it be house thieves as well as goodness gracious sakes i'd a been afeard to live in such a fraid to live why i was that scared i das and hardly go to bed or get up or lay down or set down sister ridgeway why they'd steal the very why goodness sakes you can guess what kind of a fluster i was in by the time midnight come last night i hope to gracious if i warn't afraid they'd steal some o the family i was just to that pass i didn't have no reasoning faculties no more it looks foolish enough now in the daytime but i says to myself there's my two poor boys asleep way upstairs in that lonesome room and i declare to goodness i was that uneasy i crept up there and locked him in i did and anybody would because you know when you get scared that way and it keeps running on and getting worse and worse all the time and your wits gets to addling and you get to doing all sorts o wild things and by and by you think to yourself s'posin i was a boy and was away up there and the door ain't locked and you 
she stopped looking kind of wondering and then she turned her head around slow and when her eye led on me i got up and took a walk says i to myself i can explain better how we come to not be in that room this morning if i go out to one side and study over it a little so i done it but i dasn't go fur or she'd a sent for me and when it was late in the day the people all went and then i come in and told her the noise and shooting waked up me and said and the door was locked and we wanted to see the fun so we went down the lightning rod and both of us but hurt a little and we didn't never want to try that no more and then i went on and told her all what i told uncle silas before and then she said she'd forgive us and maybe it was all right enough anyway and about what a body might expect of boys for all boys was a pretty harum scarum lot as fur as she could see and so as long as no harm hadn't come of it she judged she'd better put in her time being grateful we was alive and well and she had us still stead of fretting over what was past and done so then she kissed me and patted me on the head and dropped into a kind of a brown study and pretty soon jumps up and says why loss of mercy it's most night and said not come net what has become of that boy i see my chance so i skips up and says i run right up to town and debt him i says no you won't she says you'll stay right where you are one's enough to be lost at a time if he ain't here to supper your uncle'll go well he warned there to supper sir right after supper uncle went he come back about ten a little bit uneasy hadn't run across tom's track aunt sally was a good deal uneasy but uncle silas he said there warn't no occasion to be boys will be boys he said and you'll see this one turn up in the morning all sound and right so she had to be satisfied but she said she'd set up for him a while anyway and keep a light burning so he could see it and then when i went up to bed she come up with me and fetched her candle and tucked me in and mothered me so good i felt mean and like i couldn't look her in the face and she sat down on the bed and talked with me a long time and said what a splendid boy sid was and didn't seem to want to ever stop talking about him and kept asking me every now and then if i reckoned he could have got lost or hurt or maybe drowned and might be laying at this minute somewhere as suffering or dead and she not by him to help him and so the tears would drip down silent and i would tell her that sid was all right and would be home in the morning sure and she would squeeze my hand or maybe kiss me and tell me to say it again and keep on saying it because it done her good and she was in so much trouble and when she was going away she looked down in my eyes so steady and gentle and says the door ain't going to be locked tom and there's the window and the rod but he'll be good won't you and you won't go for my sake laws knows i wanted to go bad enough to see about tom and was all intending to go but after that i wouldn't a went not for kingdoms but she was on my mind and tom was on my mind so i slept very restless and twice i went down the rod away in the night and slipped around front and see her setting there by her candle in the window with her eyes towards the road and the tears in them and i wish i could do something for her but i couldn't only to swear that i wouldn't never do nothing to breathe her any more and the third time i wake up at dawn and slid down and she was there yet and her candle was most out and her old gray head was resting on her hand and she was asleep chapter forty two the old man was up town again before breakfast but couldn't get no track of tom and both of them sat at the table thinking and not saying nothing and looking mournful and their coffee getting cold and not eating anything and by and by the old man says did i give you the letter what letter the one i got yesterday out of the post office no 
you didn't give me no letter. Well, I must have forgot it. So he rummaged his pockets, and then went off somewheres where he had laid it down, and fetched it, and give it to her. She says, Why, it's from St. Petersburg. It's from Sis. I allowed another walk would do me go, but I couldn't stir. But before she could break it open, she drop it and run, for she see something. And so did I. It was Tom Sawyer on a mattress, and that old doctor, and Jim in her calico dress, with his hands tied behind him, and a lot of people. I hid the letter behind the first thing that come handy, and rushed. She flung herself at Tom, crying, and says, Oh, he's dead, he's dead, I know he's dead. And Tom, he turned his head a little, and muttered something or other, which showed he weren't in his right mind. Then she flung up her hands, and says, He's alive, thank God, and that's enough. And she snatched a kiss of him, and flew for the house to get the bed ready, and scattering orders right and left at the knitters and everybody else, as fast as her tongue could go, every jump of the way. I followed the men to see what they was going to do with Jim, and the old doctor and Uncle Silas followed after Tom into the house. The men was very huffy, and some of them wanted to hang Jim for an example to all the other niggers around there, so they wouldn't be trying to run away like Jim done, and making such a raft of trouble, and keeping the whole family scared most to death for days and nights. But the others said, Don't do it, it wouldn't answer at all. He ain't our nigger, and his owner would turn up and make us pay for him, sure. So that cooled them down a little, because the people that's always the most anxious for to hang a nigger that ain't done just right is always the very ones that ain't the most anxious to pay for him when they've got their satisfaction out of him. They cussed Jim considerable, though, and give him a cuff or to sod the head once in a while, but Jim never said nothing and he never let on to know me, and they took him to the same cabin, and put his own clothes on him, and chained him again, and not to no bed led this time, but to a big stable drove into the bottom log, and chained his hands too, and both legs, and said he warn't to have nothing but bread and water to eat after this, till his owner come, or he was sold at auction because he didn't come in a certain length of time, and filled up our hole, and said a couple of farmers with guns must stand watch around about the cabin every night, and a bulldog tied to the door in the daytime. And about this time, they was through with the job, and was tapering off with a kind of general yid by cussing. And then the old doctor comes and takes a look, and says, Don't be no rougher on him, than you're obliged to, because he ain't a bad nigger. When I got to where I found the boy, I see I couldn't cut the bullet out without some help, and he warned in no condition for me to leave to go and get help. And he got a little worse and a little worse, and after a long time he went out of his head, and wouldn't let me come anigh him any more, and said if I chalked his raft he'd kill me, and no end of wild foolishness like that, and I see I couldn't do anything at all with him. So I says I got to have help somehow. And the minute I says it, out crawls this nigger from somewheres and says he'll help. And he done it, too, and done it very well. Of course I judged he must be a runaway nigger. And there I was. And there I had to stick right straight along all the rest of the day and all night. It was a fix, I tell you. I had a couple of patients with the chills. And of course I'd have liked to run up to town and see them but I dasn't, because the nigger might get away, and then I'd be to blame. And yet, never a scaife come close enough for me to hail. So there I had to stick plumb until daylight this morning. And I never see a nigger that was a better nuss or faithfuller, and yet he was risking his freedom to do it, and was all tired out, too. And I see plain enough he'd been worked main hard lately. I like the nigger for that. I tell you, gentlemen, a nigger like that is worth a thousand dollars. And kind treatment, too. I had everything I needed, 
and the boy was doing as well there as he would have done at home. Better it may be because it was so quiet. But there I was with both of them on my hands, and there I had to stick till about dawn this morning. Then some men in a skiff come by, and as good luck would have it, the nigger was setting by the pallet, with his head propped on his knees, sound asleep. So I motioned them in quiet, and they slit up on him and grabbed him and tied him before he knowed what he was about, and we never had no trouble. And the boy being in a kind of a flighty sleep, too, we muffled the oars and hitched the raft on and towed her over very nice and quiet, and the nigger never made the least row nor said a word from the start. He ain't no bad nigger, gentlemen. That's what I think about him. Somebody says, well, it sounds very good, doctor, I'm obliged to say. Then the others softened up a little, too, and I was mighty thankful to the old doctor for doing Jim that quit turn, and I was glad it was according to my judgment of him, too, because I thought he had a good heart in him and was a good man the first time I see him. Then they all agreed that Jim had acted very well, and was deserving to have some notice took of it and reward. So every one of them promised, right out and hearty, that they wouldn't cuss him no more. Then they come out and locked him up. I hoped they was going to say he could have one or two of the chains took off, because they was rotten heavy, or could have meat and greens with his bread and water. But they didn't think of it, and I reckoned it weren't best for me to mix in. But... I judged I'd get the doctor's yarn to Aunt Sally somehow or other, as soon as I'd got through the breakers that was laying just ahead of me. Explanations, I mean, of how I forgot to mention about Sid being shot when I was telling how him and me put in that dratted night paddling around hunting the runaway knitter. But I had plenty time. Aunt Sally, she stuck to the sick room all day and all night. And every time I see Uncle Silas mooning around, I dodged him. Next morning I heard Tom was a good deal better, and they said Aunt Sally was gone to get a nap. So I slips to the sick room, and if I found him awake, I reckoned we could put up a yarn for the family that would wash. But he was sleeping and sleeping very peaceful, too, and pale, not fire-faced the way he was when he come. So I sat down and laid for him to wake. In about half an hour, Aunt Sally comes gliding in, and there I was, up a stump again. She motioned me to be still and sat down by me, and begun to whisper, and said we could all be joyful now, because all the symptoms was frustrate, and he'd been sleeping like that for ever so long, and looking better and peacefuller all the time, and ten to one he'd wake up in his right mind. So we sat there watching, and by and by he stirs a bit, and opened his eyes very natural, and takes a look, and says, Hello, why I'm at home. How's that? Where's the raft? It's all right, I says. And Jim, the same, I says, but couldn't say it pretty brash. But he never noticed, but says, Good, splendid. Now we're all right and safe. Did you tell Auntie? I was going to say yes. But she chipped in and says, About what, Sid? Why, about the way the whole thing was done. What whole thing? Why, the whole thing. There ain't but one. How we set the runaway nigger free. Me and Tom. Could land. Set the run. What is the child talking about? Dear, dear, out of his head again. No, I ain't out of my head. I know all what I'm talking about. We did set him free. Me and Tom. We laid out to do it, and we done it. And we done it elegant, too. He got a start, and she never checked him up. Just set and stared and stared, and let him clip along. And I see it warned no use for me to put in. Why, auntie, it cost us a power of work. Weeks of it, hours and hours, every night, whilst you was all asleep, and we had to steal candles, and the sheet, and the shirt, 
and your dress and spoons and tin plates and case knives and the warming pan and the grindstone and flour and just no end of things and you can't think what work it was to make the saws and pens and inscriptions and one thing or another and you can't think half the fun it was and we had to make up the pictures of coffins and things and anonymous letters from the robbers and get up and down the lightning rod and dig the hole into the cabin and made the rope ladder and send it in cooked up in a pie and send in spoons and things to work within your apron pocket mercy sakes and load up the cabin with rats and snakes and so on for company for jim and then you kept tom here so long with the butter in his hat that you come near spalling the whole business because the men come before we was out of the cabin and we had to rush and they heard us and let drive at us and i got my share and we dodged out of the path and let them go by and when the dogs come they weren't interested in us but went for the most noise and we got our pinu and made for the raft and was all safe and jim was a free man and we done it all by ourselves and wasn't it bully auntie well i never heard the likes of it in all my born days so it was you you little rapscallions that's been making all this trouble and turned everybody's wits clean inside out and scared us almost to death i've as good a notion as ever i had in my life to take it out o oh, you this very minute to think here i've been night after night eh you just get well once you young scamp and i lay i'll send the old harry out o oh, both o oh, ye but tom he was so proud and joyful he just couldn't hold in and his tongue just went it she it chipping in and spitting fire all long and both of them going it at once like a cat convention and she says well you get all the enjoyment you can out of it now for might i tell you if i catch you meddling with him again meddling with who tom says dropping his smile and looking surprised with who why the runaway nigger of course who you reckon tom looks at me very grave and says tom didn't you just tell me he was all right hasn't he got away and says aunt sally the runaway nigger deed he hasn't they've got him back safe and sound and he's in that cabin again on bread and water and loaded down with chains till he's claimed or sold tom rose square up in bed with his eye hot and his nostrils opening and shutting like gills and sings out to me they hain't no right to shut him up Shun. and don't you lose a minute turned him loose he ain't no slave he's as free as any critter that walks this earth what does the child mean i mean every word i say aunt sally and if somebody don't go i'll go i've knowed him all his life and so has tom there old miss watson died two months ago and she was ashamed she ever was going to sell him down the river and said so and she set him free in her will then what on earth did you want to set him free for seeing he was already free well that is a question i must say and just like women why i wanted the adventure of it and i'd waded neck deep in blood too goodness alive aunt polly if she weren't standing right there just inside the door looking as sweet and contented as an angel half full of pie i wish i may never aunt sally jumped for her and most hugged the head off of her and cried over her and i found a good enough place for me under the bed for it was getting pretty sultry for us seemed to me and i peeped out and in a little well tom's aunt polly shook herself loose and stood there looking across at tom over her spectacles kind of grinding him into the earth you know and then she says yes you better turn your head away i would if i was you tom oh dearie me says aunt sally is he changed so why that ain't tom it's sid tom's 
Tom's. Why, where is Tom? He was here a minute ago. You mean where's Huck Finn? That's what you mean. I reckon I hain't raised such a scape as my Tom all these years not to know him when I see him. That would be a pretty howdy-do. Come out from under that bed, Huck Finn. So I done it, but not feeling brash. At Sally she was one of the mixed you best looking persons I ever see, except one, and that was Uncle Silas, when he come in and they told it all to him. It kind of made him drunk, as you may say, and he didn't know nothing at all the rest of the day, and preached a prayer meeting sermon that night that gave him a rattling reputation, because the oldest man in the world couldn't have understood it. So Tom's Aunt Polly, she told all about who I was and what. And I had to up and tell how I was in such a tight place that when Mrs. Phelps took me for Tom Sawyer, she chipped in and says, Oh, go on and call me Aunt Sally. I'm used to it now, and tain't no need to change. That when Aunt Sally took me for Tom Sawyer, I had to stand it. There weren't no other way, and I knowed he wouldn't mind, because it would be nuts for him, be a mystery, and he'd make an adventure out of it, and be perfectly satisfied. And so it turned out, and he let on to be Sid, and made things as soft as he could for me. And his Aunt Polly, she said Tom was right about old Miss Watson setting Jim free in her will. And so, sure enough, Tom Sawyer had gone and took all that trouble and bother to set a free knit or free, and I couldn't ever understand before, until that minute and that talk, how he could help a body set a knit or free with his bringing up. Well, Aunt Polly, she said, that when Aunt Sally wrote to her that Tom and Sid had come all right and safe, she says to herself, Look at that now. I might have expected it, letting him go off that way without anybody to watch him. So now I got to go and traps all the way down the river, eleven hundred mile, and find out what that creature's up to this time. As long as I couldn't seem to get any answer out of you about it. Why, I never heard nothing from you, says Aunt Sally. Well, I wonder. Why, and I wrote you twice to ask you what you could mean by Sid being here. Well, I never got him, sis. Aunt Polly, she turns around slow and severe and says, You, Tom. Well, what? He says, kind of pettish. Don't you what mean? You impudent thing. Hand out them letters. But letters? Them letters. I be bound if I have to take a hold of you, I'll. They're in the trunk. There, now and they're just the same as they was when I got them out of the office. I hain't looked into them, I hain't touched them, but I know they'd make trouble, and I thought if you weren't in no hurry, I'd. Well, you do need skinning, there ain't no mistake about it. And I wrote another one to tell you I was coming, and I suppose he. No, it come yesterday. I hain't read it yet, but it's all right. I've got that one. I wanted to offer to bet to dollars she hadn't, but I reckoned maybe it was just as safe to not to. So I never said nothing. Chapter 43 The first time I catched Tom private, I asked him what was his idea, Tom of the evasion. What it was he'd planned to do if the evasion worked all right, and he managed to set a nader free, back was already free before. And he said what he had planned in his head from the start, if we got Jim out all safe, was for us to run him down the river on the raft, and have adventures plumb to the mouth of the river, and then tell him about his being free, and take him back up home on a steamboat, in style, and pay him for his lost time, and write word ahead, and get out all the niggers around, and have them waltz him into town with a torchlight procession, and a brass band, and then he would be a hero, and so would me. But I reckoned it was about as well the way it was. We had Jem out of the chains in no time, and when Aunt Polly and Uncle Silas and Aunt Sally found out how good he helped the doctor nurse Tom, 
they made a key of fuss over him and fixed him up prime and give him all he wanted to eat and a good time and nothing to do and we had him up to the sick room and had a high talk and tom give jim forty dollars for being prisoner for us so patient and doing it up so good and jim was pleased most to death and busted out and says don't now huck what i tell you what i tell you up to on jackson aslin i told you i got a hairy breeze and what's de sign on it and i told you i'd been rich onct and winiter to be rich a jean and it's come true and he she is dud now don't talk to me signs is signs might i tell you and i know jis well i i was born it'd be rich a jean as i's a standin' he dis minute and then tom he talked along and talked along and says let's all three slide out of here one of these nights and get an outfit and go for howling adventures amongst the injuns over in the territory for a couple of weeks or two and i says all right at suits me but i ain't got no money for to buy the outfit and i reckon i couldn't get none from home because it's likely cat has been back afore now and got it all away from judge thatcher and drunk up no he hain't tom says it's all there yet six thousand dollars and more and your pap hain't ever been back since hadn't when i come away anyhow jim says kind of solemn he ain't a comin back no more huck i says why jim nem and why huck but he ain't comin back no mo but i kept at him so at last he says don't you member de house dat was floatin down de river and dey was a man in dot kivered up and i went in and unkivered him and didn't let you come in well den you can get your money when you wants it case dat was him tom's most well now and got his bullet around his neck on a watch guard for a watch and is always seeing what time it is and so there ain't nothing more to write about and i am rotten glad of it because if i'd a knowed what a trouble it was to make a book i wouldn't a tackled it and ain't a going to know more but i reckon i got to lie out for the territory ahead of the rest because aunt sally she's going to adopt me and civilize me and i can't stand it i'd been there before the end yours truly huck fenn you have listened to adventures of huckleberry fenn by mark twain